Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, and welcome back. Welcome back to the Porsche Cool Podcast. Welcome back to another Owner's Stories. If you haven't been here before, my name is Michael Barth. This is episode 183, but it's uh, Owner's Stories number 76. Um, if you haven't been to the podcast before, there's a lot to listen to. Um, you could start here, or you could go all the way back to number one, where I was talking solo, and then my mate Steve uh, joined the podcast. Steve and I chatting all things Porsche. Uh, Steve's my mate in Sydney that has a 997.1 GT3. Um, at the moment, we've just got owner stories episodes, though, uh, due to work pressures and life, I guess. We call it life. I know that's no excuse, but that is the excuse I'm going to use today. Um, so this is owner stories. Owner stories is every Tuesday. Um, because we don't have the other episode, I'm just going to mention this today because this episode I'm actually recording pretty much for the week. It's Friday here in London. It's Friday, the 27th of May. Um, I'm going to be joined very shortly by Andy. Andy's a fellow Australian, but he's been living in Ireland for over 20 years. Andy, as you would have noticed in the title, has got a very, very special 911, a very special GT3, um, amongst, you know, another car as well. Um, well, I think he still has the other car. I'm pretty sure he does. Um, so I'm really looking forward to talking to Andy because uh, I think it's going to be a, an interesting one. And I know there's a lot of guys out there, um, a lot of people who have been on, a couple of people have been on Owner Stories before who will be really interested in this one. Anyway, I'm going on a little bit here, but I just want to say, if you if you haven't been to the podcast before, we do have a Patreon page. Uh, it's Porsche Cooled, uh, patreon.com slash Porsche Cooled, or you just go to patreon.com, uh, search Porsche Cooled, it will come up straight away. Um, that's where you can support the podcast. You can help us or help me at the moment keep talking. Um, I will throw in another occasional episode um, with, with Steve and I. Um, at the moment, it's a little bit difficult just due to our schedules, but we will try and throw in an episode here or there. And that's about it. Let me uh, get Zoom fired up. Let me get Andy from Ireland and let's start talking about his Porsche Cooled owner story. Okay, welcome back everyone. Welcome back to Owner Stories number 76. As I said before, I am now joined by uh, Andy. Andy's coming in from Ireland. Good morning, Andy. I really like I really like doing these ones because we're on the same time zone. Good morning, Andy. How are you? Yeah, hi, Michael. Yeah, good to see you after so many messages. Finally got together. Yeah, uh, I think I think we've been toing and froing for how long <laughs> since April? Well, not yeah. not about toing and froing. We've been chatting, but trying to organise a chat. I think it's been a few months, hasn't it? Yeah, and and things got a bit heated in terms of my. Porsche life, so I had to had to divert to uh, try and buy another one uh, for a few weeks. So yeah, so now it's good to see you. I'm good to be the same time zone. So I'm in Northern Ireland, just so everyone knows. Is that the best part of Ireland, Northern Ireland? Um, we're an hour south of Belfast. So the best way to explain it is if you're on the east coast, you've got Belfast in the north and Dublin in the south. We're, we're halfway between, almost on the border. Um, it's just that we're in the UK system, I guess, tax system and car system and all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, to, to tax a Porsche in the Republic is a lot more expensive than to tax one up here, like about four times the cost. So oh, really? Yeah, and the car costs are a lot more. So literally you can drive across the border 15 minutes here and you're paying 50, 30, 40% more for a Porsche and then a lot more to actually put it on the road. So yeah, we have fairly empty roads as well compared to England. So it has its advantages, yes. It's, it's you have great roads. You have great roads. The listeners can probably, I think I might have mentioned in the brief intro that I did, but the listeners can probably see Andy's got a bit of an accent. Andy's yeah. Andy's a fellow Australian. But you've been yeah. living here for a long time, right? You're living in the UK for a long time. Yeah, I left Australia in 98 um, at 28 years old. So uh, my, my mum's English, so I had the passport and she's from Essex. So I didn't have any problems with passports. So I just sort of left at 28. I was a bit... Um, I don't know, just wanted to come for a year in England, the UK. And, uh, <laughs> One year, uh, and then <laughs> 20 odd years later. And I met a girl. <laughs> That's what all it takes, isn't it? That's and all an it Irish takes. Girl. So, uh, yeah, but I, you know, I actually sort of loved England. Um, um, yeah, lots of it I, I really liked. I didn't know if I'd like it or not, but I just sort of got the whole vibe. And, and London in the 98, coming after the millennium, was a really, really exciting place. Yeah, really exciting yeah, place. Yeah. It still is. Um, no, but it is. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, a super city, I call it. Um, but I remember the first week I was there, I'd moved in and um, we're down at the pub on the Sunday afternoon and um, in the beer garden and, a, and, a, and the Concord flew over oh, about right. to land. And I didn't even have, I didn't know the thing was still flying. And I'm sort of looking up this Concord coming into Heathrow, thinking, oh, okay, this is a 
this is the centre of something. So, yeah, so I sort of got the vibe and um, a lot of good cars were floating around in the late 90s in the city of London. Yeah. That's the thing about London, right? I mean, I, you know, coming to London in the, in the 90s, I mean, just even being around wherever, being around Knightsbridge or anywhere really, you'd always see fantastic cars, wouldn't you? You just, and you still do. I mean, every time yeah. I go out anywhere, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be Mayfair. <laughs> anywhere, like in Canary Wharf here where I am the other day, I keep seeing this. I, I've seen this guy before and he's got, and I'm a bit of a fan of, of the Ferrari GT4 Dino because it's a bit of that underdog, you know, yeah. that sort of, that shape of it. And there's a guy that has a red one around here. And it's like, it's just such a, it's such a beautiful shape, that car. I mean, underrated. And then there's so many Porsches and you just see so many cars. But was that the, you know, that was a good, that, you know, when I, because of me, I don't live here, right? I just, I come here and I spend time here and whatever, as I just said to you. And, and that's always a problem, right? When you live here, you, you, you've got all those cars at your disposal. It's so easy to get them and to drive them and to use them. And where you are in Ireland, I mean, you've got, so, and we'll talk about that later on, but you've got so many great roads, haven't you? You've got so many open spaces to take your car out. Yeah, the roads, um, some of the road surfaces aren't great, but the roads in general are pretty empty. <clears throat> and I'll just, well, you might want to edit it out, but the policing here is a bit, a bit, uh, a bit slack. <laughs> is it? <laughs> well, it's just a bit like probably Australian that, 80s all oh, right so no yeah. speed cameras no speed uh there's, there's the odd speed camera in belfast we don't have the average there's no averaging cameras which seems oh, okay. the light of definitely england when i was over there the other, right. the other week um we don't have an, any averaging cameras like one tunnel down south has one but they're gonna they're right. coming um it's just that sort of a thing um i mean again <laughs> Well, there's stories I could tell you, but I probably won't tell you. <laughs> but, yeah, about what happens. And it, it's it's not like it's – it's. Look, we, we, we pick our moments, let's put it this way. But, um, but yeah, it's it's a good culture. Yeah. yeah, but it's funny for us, Andy. Sorry for interrupting. It's funny for us, though, because speed cameras in Australia, they're just like – they're everywhere, right? Yeah. And even in the UK, in London, they're, they're, there's, there's speed cameras, right? They're everywhere. And then you listen to other podcasts like in the US. I was listening to something the other day. They don't have speed cameras in the US. They don't have speed oh. cameras in California. You know what I mean? It's like, what a what a great situation, you know? We did a five-day trip to Scotland a month ago, and I just couldn't believe the cameras. Any sort of town in Scotland had these cameras and all over the place, and um, I just wasn't used to it. I really had to watch myself. Not that I run around speeding, but you know what I'm saying. There's certain times when the roads are, when you've got good visibility, you want to, you know, you want to let it go a bit. And, um, yeah, it's just the way it is. So, so I'm sort of trying to make the most of that um, in terms of actually – being able to um, enjoy a good road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let's get let's get into the cars because we've got a few to talk about. Um, mm-hmm. let, let's let's start. Let's start where it, and I apologise because my camera's gone off, but it, it's still recording, so don't worry, it'll come back on. We always like to start the podcast, owner stories, especially where it all began. And you've sort of given me a little bit of an insight of where it happened, what, what you're into. But let's let's start about let's just. With Porsche, was that something that you that you grew up with? Was that something that, you know, people talk about the poster on the wall. I never had the posters on the wall. Um, but you talk about the posters on the wall. You talk about, you know, people in your area when you're living in Sydney. Um, did they have Porsches? Did you have friends that had them? When did you start first noticing yeah. Porsche as a brand? Yeah, for me, it was – I lived – I grew up in Tasmania till I was 13. Okay. So, yeah, so in 1970 to 83 it was, so 13 years. So my, and there just weren't many there. Tasmania, for other, you know, it's not the most affluent place. It's nice now, but it wasn't back then. Um, I was trying to think, the, the first one the, the first one I saw, and I, the only reason I know the year is because the same year Star Wars came out. It was that summer, 77, and we have um, regattas. Is that a term that like a show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With rides and everything, and there was there was a car thing there, and there was definitely there was an orange Porsche at that, and I was only seven, but I remember, I remember walking. I remember we had it had it running, and I remember walking around trying to figure out the engine. Even as a kid, I knew something was weird. Yeah, something was weird, <laughs> and it was revving it. And I was trying to figure out what was going on, and my I sort of said by myself with a friend so it wasn't in adults to sort of explain when you know and we're just kids to him so but it was it was definitely orange and to me it seemed quite wide i don't know i don't know if it was modified well i don't know there's yeah. no photos but but that was one and then after that i was really into probably muscle cars the corvettes and all that because that was my poster would have been a corvette and a lamborghini and it wasn't a port because i just didn't have any exposure to them 
Um, right. Yeah, we used to go, there was a speedway outside Devonport where I grew up, um, and that was like a dirt oval track. And a friend, of, my best friend's dad was into cars, and he used to take us there on a Saturday night. And there were things called sprint cars, which are like tubular frame car with a big wing on the top. Yeah, yeah. The sprint car. And they just go around this oval track, hanging the back end out. And they were probably supercharged V8s, and they used to run on Avgas or something funny fuel. And I just remember the smell and the sound. And every Saturday night for what seemed like ages, we were going out to that. And occasionally they'd have a crash, one flipped, you know. You, yeah, yeah. You know, place that this guy might be, you know, he, he, he survived. But that was probably late 70s. So I definitely remember it around 79, 80. Um, so the Corvette, I've said this thing about Corvette Stingrays. Remember that as a kid. But, but there was no Corvettes in Tasmania or Australia, right? No, I don't know what it was. It was movies we were watching and things like that. It was just because I was sort of the, the bigger shape. engine. Yeah, I didn't have – none of our friends had Porsches. Um, yeah, that just – it just wasn't around us. But I definitely remember that orange. I remember the orange one. That's it. And then I remember it wasn't until I really went to Melbourne that I really remember. Yeah, and even in Melbourne, it wasn't even full of them either. Um, in my memory anyway, you'd see them and you'd – you just wouldn't be talking to owners. You're only a kid, you know. You just wouldn't see them. But my my mum worked for a place in the late 80s, and the boss had a 928. Um, it was burgundy with a – I remember the burgundy interior. I'm pretty sure yep. it must have been burgundy exterior. Yep. I never got a go in it, though. Um, she had a few goes in it with him, and she used to complain how low it was and yeah. how hard it was to get out of it. I used to think, oh, God, you, you know. Yeah, yeah I, remember in, I remember in Sydney there was a guy that owned – actually, he owns a – He's part of the chicken family in Sydney, and he had uh, he had a clothing store, and he also had a nine two eight. And I remember I used to see that when I sort of when I first kind of moved to Sydney, he still had it, and I used to see it driving around. I thought, man, that is that is one cool car. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was, was a really really it, nice looking. Even car the eighties, that that rear end it looked space age. Uh, it might have been in the early nineties actually, but 90, yeah, 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 it was a ten. 12-year-old car designed by them, but that rear end, I remember the rear end. Yeah. Not so much the front end, it was a rear end. Yeah. Oh, I remember the burgundy. I remember I remember going there twice. I was trying to see if he'd give me a go, but I must have been 18 or 19. And um, yeah, I didn't get much chance to go there, but I knew he had it. I remember the burgundy interior of that sort of folded, you know, that, that seat they do. It was um, the seats in that car. Yeah. The 928 yeah. interior when you first saw it and you went, it was like nothing before, because it was so sunken, wasn't it? It was yeah, just like yeah. such a different look. And yeah, but I never got a go at it. Um, no, but my mum, she used to complain whenever he'd give her a lift. It. I wouldn't <laughs> be doing that. So yeah, there was that. And then um, it just used to, I don't know, who else? I did, we just didn't know anyone with them, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that's why in the 90s, I was, I was into mechanical stuff. I was into planes as well. I remember anything mechanical. I remember in Devonport where I lived in the late 70s, they had the first jet coming into the airport. It right. was going to land. And I remember literally being on my you – know, people lived near, friends of ours, and I was on the roof all, literally all day waiting for this jet to come in. Right. Yeah. It came around the hill. It was a 727, and I, he was pulling manoeuvres that – he was flying in very low, <laughs> and it was worth the wait because he came in really low, coming around this hill, and I thought probably wasn't even legal then. But um, but all that just fascinated me. So that's why I ended up doing mechanical engineering when I, in the late 80s with sort of thoughts to be a – a Formula One designer or something, you know, we all thought Fantastic. that was in the degree, um, but it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> it was all maths and physics. I thought you were and... going to say you wanted to be a pilot. Um, no, it was definitely, um, yeah, that sort of maybe when I was younger, that sort of left me and it became cars and mechanical stuff. And yeah, I mean, jet engines and everything, but still fascinated me. But but I think half of us in the course was all like, you're going to be car designers. And, and some of the guys did go on to do that. And the reality is very different. So the, yeah, you end up designing a seatbelt for five years or a seat or something. It's yeah, end, but, yeah. But being into Porsche and also you know interested in mechanical engineering and then you know following that sort of path and then the car you have today, it kind of kind of all makes sense though, doesn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah, like being yeah. interested in all that workings of how everything, you know, those little nuances that that happen in 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 the car you have today. You know what I mean? Let's yeah. Let's yeah. go back though. Let's the the car journey. Let's just talk about the. We don't talk about all of them, but let's talk about the important one and the one that probably you mentioned to me. What sort of cars were you into when you first got your license? So this is in Tasmania or this is when you went to? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I was I moved when I was 13 to Melbourne. Okay. So um, so at, at 17 and nine months, I think you could get your learners or something. Yeah, something like that. I was straight in to get my learners. Um, 
My first car was actually my mum's old car. Um, I, I inherited that. Well, I bought it off her. Um, it was a D- Datsun 240K, 240K, right, yeah. which is it preceded the 240Z. Right. right. So you might have to Google that one, but it's um. I know the 240Z. So 240K is yeah, the yeah. same shape. No, it's not. It's it's the same end. <laughs> it's it's not the same shape. No. It's not a two. <laughs> it's it's coming to its own now apparently, but back then it wasn't that cool. Right. It's a two. It's a coupe. It's two door. Um, but it had the same 2.4 liter block. I might be wrong. Guys might correct me, but the 240Z ran twin carburetor, right? Whereas this just ran a normal single basic carburetor. So it was it was the same 2.4 liter f- oh, straight six. Okay. I just googled it. I know that car. Yeah. 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 I, Bloody ugly back then, but uh, I was embarrassed with it. I'm being honest. So I was sort of driving to university in that um, in the late 80s. Um, so it was a 73. So it was a 15 year old car. Then it was just an old car, um, yeah. but it was an automatic. <laughs> okay. But but <clears throat> I remember um, I had it a, a while. It was all right. It was a three speed automatic, and it, you sort of push the accelerator to take off. You know, or it, in third gear, it wouldn't do much. And I was I was cleaning it one day and had all the mats out in it. And because um, my mum had put aftermarket mats in, and I'd I'd taken it for a spin without the mats for some reason, and I gunned it, and there was this little click down switch on the ex- throttle, right? That the aftermarket mats were blocking the throttle going full travel, right? That last few millimeters, so it wasn't kicking down, but it kicked down that day. So it used to kick down the second and just howl. <laughs> so once I discovered that, <laughs> it was like for young and old that old day. <laughs> I'm howling around the suburbs. Um, and it, yeah, it used to go because it used to rev because it was quite a small capacity six cylinder. You know, same format as a BMW, really, you know, straight six. Uh, it yeah. was an odd looking car. I mean, I remember it yeah. now. I do remember it. And, and yeah. if the listeners, what the listeners should do if they don't know what a 240Z is, they should Google that first and then Google the 240K and see the difference. But it always had that large amount of, of panel behind the, the glass, at the yeah. back there, didn't it? It always had that odd. Yeah, that you're really bad. Very really strange bad. shape. But the today, end, I guess you look at it, it's a little bit quirky. I guess you could say it's quirky, but it, and it's the kind back of lights look GTR. The back lights are look at, have a GTR look. If you look at the rear lights in one, um, yeah. they're, they're, they're early, yeah. So Oh, they do too. I just saw them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's a 240K. Uh, it was called a Skyline or something. There's some, there's some GTR connection with the 240K. There's a certain model that's worth a lot of money. Um, and that one, if I hadn't have, it was written off, by the way. But if it had been a manual and not written off, um, it was a really good, really good car, actually. I didn't write it off, but I wasn't driving it, by the way. Right. But um, um, that lasted a few years. But, um, yeah, they've come into their own. It had been a manual. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was a pretty cool dash. The dash had the sort of 240Z looking dash. Recessed it's still things. a two-door, though. It's a two-door, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a two-door. Yeah. It's not a station wagon. It's not that boring. Yeah. It's not a Falcon, yeah, well, my dad was. Um, I sort of found it recently. My dad sort of was into his car, so my dad had bought it because he knew the history of those cars were really good condition. And, and I found mm. it recently before I was born. He had even had nice, pretty hotted up or pretty nice Cortina. Okay. Um, but I think once he had a few kids, that that left him. You know, the money end of it. <laughs> he had to sort of be sensible. So, yeah, the two forty k. So yeah, that was put into a tree um, <laughs> by. Um, yeah. Um, Speaking of Cortinas, though, I saw one advertised the other day, the 70s Cortina, and it was some ridiculous amount of yeah, money. It could have even yeah. been on collecting cars. It could have been in the UK. It was crazy money. Yeah, yeah. Like, they've become very collectible, obviously, as well as everything else. Well, the 240K, I think a good one of those Emmanuel is getting decent money now, and they're hotting them up in all sorts, which yeah, is I bet. great. But that's just the way it is. But, um, yeah, um, when I went sensible, so I become become an engineer. I, I graduated, um, and I, that was put into a tree just after I graduated. It was a part, anyway, it was a long story, but yeah. And um, I had to take the blame for it. Let's put it that way. Um, oh, but really? um, yeah, but um, something after a party was it? My mum only found that out actually at our wedding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? In the best man's speech. Oh, okay. Anyway, yeah, it was a long story, but um, but then I had went sensible. So I was an engineer, and I bought the Ford Fair uh, Ford Fairmont. Right, yeah. Um, the squarey one of, yeah, well, yep. yeah, I, I had that for a year. I just, because I had to travel for work and I was a consulting engineer, so I thought it'd be sensible. And um, I had that for about a year. Um, so it was one of the, you know, the big block six. Not, yeah. It wasn't a performance car. It was fine. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I sort of realised. Yeah, it was a good cruiser. Yeah, because hmm. I used to do some miles up the country. Um, and then I just realised, well, you know, I'm getting paid here. I'm going to get back into cars. So then my next car was a 
a Mitsubishi, not not the Starion, it was a Cordia Turbo GSR. Right. Which is a front wheel drive turbocharged yeah. 1.8 litre. Um, <clears throat> it was actually a car that was came out after the Starion. It was an right. 85 car. So it was that new generation of cars, whereas the Starion was a bit, bit of an older generation rear wheel drive. So I had that. It was a 1.8 litre um, turbo. Probably some people will know them. The oh, pursuit, okay. In New South Wales, the cop police had to buy them as pursuit cars. Right. They definitely ran because they couldn't catch the robbers because <laughs> uh, the robbers were, were nicking them. Um, it was basically the precursor to the WRX yeah. 10 years before. Cordia yeah. Turbo, right? Yeah, GSR. So it was um, front-wheel drive, um, 1.8 litre. had a big Garrett Turbo on it. It was an oversized turbo, and they didn't tune it really from – factory because it didn't run an intercooler but that right. is oversized garrett turbo it was big so the mine i bought it actually modified it had a intercooler on it um that was the main thing so the boost was put up and to, to boost those cars back then in the 80s they were very basic um ecu they, didn't, well, they had an ecu but only a few inputs um and the way the Turbo was controlled, was pneumatic, it was just taking a pressure feed off the exhaust right. and opening a diaphragm in the turbo wastegate. It was literally a pneumatic pipe, and all you did to modify it, you just cut a T, cut the pipe in half, put a T piece in it, ran a tube, T piece tube to the cockpit with right. a valve, and just bled air off this, this pressure line so that the turbo didn't realize oh, how to say it. it allowed the turbo to ramp up to a higher boost. So oh, right. So you didn't map it. It was one of these things. So you'd go to a hardware shop and buy this stuff, brass <laughs> fittings. And you'd so have you this... did that to yours? Oh, yeah, definitely did that mine. And um, we're also nicking stuff. We're, not... we're going to records and getting stuff off Saabs. So I think, Saab... yeah, from memory, Saab road cars, TurboTech was ahead of everyone else. Right. Um, and they had these uh, bypass valves. Um, they were running those. And that was really when, when, you're, when you're in, early, in the early turbos, when you're going through first, particularly first and second, when you come off the throttle, it would stall the turbo. Right. Yeah, the turbo spool would stall. And you'd have to have this bypass line. So we were adding those from Saabs. We're running those. It's probably like a blow-off valve now. You, you sometimes hear a blow-off valve in some of these hotted up. Yeah. How did you know, though, Andy? How did you know that the Saab parts would fit the stereo, fit the um, um, audio? Well, it was just really trial and error, yeah, and talking to guys. There was no internet then. So yeah, I was going to say, you couldn't search it, right? It's not like there's yeah. a forum about it. You there just have to a, work it out. There was this thing, it's Australian Turbo Club, ATC. Right, and I was, I was running it. There was a guy who started it. There was a load of good, good guys in that. It seemed to be a lot of Mitsubishi's mainly in it. Yeah, and they'd share ideas what they'd done. So, so the minor had the intercooler on it. So someone had already modified it, and I, th- I think there was an electronic boost controller on it that had been taken off. Something had happened anyway, and um, but the intercooler was there, so you could run that higher boost without um, causing detonation. So, um, so basically, just double the boost. Right. So this thing was, um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty, pretty fast for its day. Yeah. And the problem was traction, front wheel drive traction. So, <laughs> but once you're up and spooled, once you had the turbo spooled, it would, um, it would keep up with the the big V8s. Yeah. So did you get in, did you get into <laughs> into any trouble with that car? No, I didn't. No. No. I, I, I didn't have a one speed. It wasn't ticket. crashed that one. You just sold that one on. Uh no. Ah, uh, sorry, it was crashed. Sorry. Yep. Actually. Yeah, it wasn't my fault again. <laughs> no, <it> was, <laughs> a taxi in the city centre ran a red light. Um, it was actually a storm and actually the, the light had actually turned around. So he thought he was seeing a green light. So this taxi came in to one of the main junctions there and I just couldn't stop it. It was The brakes weren't great on it. So I, I went into the front of, into the side of him. So that ended up being a um, – I got it fixed and then I used that opportunity to do body kit on the front and everything and all sorts of things. Um it was, it was just panel damage at the front. It was um, I, mean, I had that car for about three years. Um, Are these the sort of cars you yeah. take? You wouldn't take these cars on a track or anything in in Victoria or anything, would you? Uh, I didn't. Um, I didn't know. I mean, you, you probably could have. They were really strong engines. Yeah, right. I, I sort of proved that because I um, I mean, it was one day I actually disconnected the wastegate completely, so you had unlimited right. boost. Wow. Um, so literally, the, the the wastegate on the turbo wouldn't release any air so so you had to actually control the boost just by the revs i think by about two and a half thousand revs it was almost on maximum boost or two eight 
So okay, I, so we're starting to see a trend mm, here. The need to, t- to tinker and to get this yeah, power, yeah. this extra power. So what happens right. after the cordia? What what comes next? Well, I always wanted a starring because because the starring guys in the club that they'll be daddies really. Um, they're the more expensive car. They're rear wheel drive. They're a two liter turbo. So they weren't a much bigger engine, but they just seemed to get better traction. Um, so I got a JA, which is the first. It, was, it would have been an eighty two. Um, yep. It was silver. Uh, most of them were silver, and had the. They all had these full leather interior with these sort of space age looking seats. Um, leather, leather, leather seats. They had this weird seat belt arrangement where the seat belt was in the door. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and that was that was modified. <laughs> The thing, um, let me just tell the listeners, though, because if, if listeners don't know what – I don't know whether a Starion was available. Was it available worldwide or was it – I think it was, was it, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it was America. Americans had a – I think they had a 2.6 or 2.5. England had seemed to have a 2.5 or 2.6 when I talked to a lot of guys here. Yeah. It was all over the place, yeah, yeah. Because I, I um, remember it, and I told you before we started recording. I remember yeah. it because I remember I worked with someone that had one. Yeah. And I remember at the time they were like – it, it was a sports car. It was it was still special. Even this car wasn't you know wasn't brand new. It was like like you said. I think I told you it was an eighty two or whatever this guy it had. Eighty two, yeah. yeah, gold one. And yeah. I remember seeing it and I thought, even at the time, you know, ten years later or whatever it was, eight years later, it was still a pretty special looking car. You know what I mean? I was quite young, but it was like still like wow, that's a that's a special looking car at the time. Yeah. And they weren't and they weren't cheap. I remember they weren't cheap. They were very expensive. Yeah, yeah. They're actually based on a scorpion. If you ever, oh, that's right. Yeah, if you ever open the front of a front end, if you open the bottom of a scorpion and a starry next to each other, the whole front from the from the from the windscreen forward, it's basically a scorpion. You know, so that was the base, and that's quite an old design, really. So, um, but they had this thing, and if you if you modif- put nice wheels on them, um, the Simmons wheels, which were big in Australia, yes, like a BBS probably thing. Yeah, if you put them on that and stance them up they they looked amazing even in the 90s um there's an amazing navy blue one going around melbourne at the time really it tinted the rear lights it done all this stuff and used to we used to spot it every so often we never knew who it was, it was like this it was like this, this this unknown guy we appear every so often this hotted <laughs> up thing and just disappear we one of the nicest ones i'd ever seen um but yeah so but be, be, the the JA didn't have a oh, forget now that didn't have a water cooled they weren't water cooling the turbo so I remember you had to um, there's a really set cool down procedure you had to do you had to idle them otherwise right. if you if you shut them off hot they just um, fry the oil uh, right. in the turbo bearing and you just end up wrecking your oil after a while so you'd, you'd have this big thing of idling for a minute or two um, we'd take hours out at night and you'd um you'd do a really hard pull. You know, in a few gears, quickly jump out of the car, idle it, and you'd lift the bonnet, and you'd, you'd have a glowing uh, oh, <laughs> part really? of the turbo, a glowing wreck. Wow! <laughs> oh, they run hot, yeah. But there was something about the water cooling. Or maybe the, the JB had a water cooled turbo. There was something about that, anyway. I might be getting confused with the Cordia, but there was, yeah, there was something about that. So, so both the Cordia and the Starion were their first generation of each of those. Um, right. I had the Starion. Um, what did I do? At one stage, I had the stereo, and then I remember I had to, because I had to have work, I remember running a Nissan Bluebird with it as my right. daily, <laughs> and it was all getting a bit mad. Another um, car which people are chasing after today, which is surprises me. Yeah, it was the, it was just the Bluebird, just the, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the everyday thing. It was actually yeah. quite, quite a comfortable car, so I had this really hot car for the weekends, and most of my driving was done in this blue bluebird work okay so, so you got two cars you got the bluebird you got the yeah you got the starion so the starion you had for some time then i think now that that for a couple of years so i left australia in 98 and i don't think i had the starion when i left oh that's why i'm a bit vague on that i must have oh no, no i know yeah i bought it actually it was a mitsubishi magna so i went sensible again okay the last year yeah that's yep. what it was so that's yeah that's, that's what special. my dad had mitsubishi magna yeah it was just <laughs> i went sensible again because i was burning money um yeah so that's why i thought you know it was 98 and i thought well, i'm gonna go to england because i've got the passport but inter- still interesting cars you know like looking back at it now you they're yeah. interesting i mean especially i mean not the 240k right yeah. from your mum. still an interesting car your dad had an idea he bought that car it was automatic but it's still still mm-hmm. fun still a little bit different to what was out there you know having lived in australia it's still a different looking car mm. then you go to the cordia then you go to the starion so you like these you know there's a turbo trend there though you have the turbo you like yeah, the idea of the turbo yeah. which which i want to get into why you didn't think about buying a turbo when you even when you bought your latest car or even your first yeah. porsche so yeah. 
you're is is the Starion? Let's get into the Porsches though. But is the Starion a car that you regret selling? Is that a car that you would think I would get one again today, or is that time over for you? Yeah, I would get one if they were cheap. But I know if I drive one now, I'd be disappointed. Um, yeah. Well, maybe I wouldn't. But um, that's the car I remember. I just have real special memories of that car. We used to drive them. Like we used to drive them a lot. Yeah. And I don't even remember looking at mileage. Yeah. I don't know what's going on now. I don't, don't quite understand what's going on now. But I just don't remember seeing a car and going, well, what's your mileage? <laughs> the That's first true, question. actually. Yeah, yeah. I just don't you remember You just drive that. it. It's not like you're watching miles at all. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, and we would really – we'd go cruising down. So, you know, Melbourne is a – you've got to go a few hours to get to the coast. Yeah. We'd do that quite often. I remember waking up in summer and we'd have a cruise organised and I'd be looking at the temperature and I'd hope it wouldn't be too hot because you'd lose boost. <laughs> You could feel that you'd be ten percent down. Really? On, on a, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, with a boosted um, car like that. That's not good in, in Victorian summers, that's for sure. Because Melbourne yeah. get really hot. Melbourne's actually even hotter than Sydney sometimes. Yeah, we. I remember doing cruises. And it was mainly Starians. And I remember one guy. He was only about eighteen. He just bought it that that week. He came on the first cruise and um, he back ended someone. He wrote it off. Right. It was in Torquay, and um, he didn't have any insurance. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Guy was there crying at the side. I didn't know what to do. Like, okay. so we'd sort of organise it. It wasn't one of our cars. It back ended, <laughs> wow. but that uh, didn't make it any better. But he, um, yeah, and it was sort of we did these great, just had these great times. Maybe 12, 15 cars, and we just barrel through the Great Ocean Road. And, great know, drive. And the Starion was quite a still attracted attention in the nineties. Um, but yeah, the Starion, yeah, that was just a car that was, a, yeah. I'd have one now, but the same car would cost twenty five grand. Or yeah, something. I was looking at that. And you're you're so far. Yeah above all of that now too which we've got to come back to but that passion yeah. is there right you've got this passion for cars you've got the passion you know the power that the the tweaking the modification so when you come to the uk living in london we don't always need a car so when yes. did the first porsche come when did your first porsche is oh. that when you moved to ireland or is that when, no, when did that come um, about? yeah that that this, i've come to london for a fellow decade or so really because i came to london um and actually, was mad. I just wasn't prepared for the whole train system. So when I when I landed in London, I, my relatives were Essex, and I had this idea: I'm going to live in Essex and work somewhere consultancy around there. Um, so I was in Essex for a month or two, and even before I got to England, my boss in Australia was actually English from Essex, right. and his right. brother-in-law was a car dealer. And I'd I'd said to him, "Can you ask your brother-in-law to find me a go? Uh, uh, sorry, a, 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 three, a 205 GTI. Right. I'd driven one." My brother's actually per, was a he's a Peugeot mechanic, and he'd give me a go in one they'd had at, um, in Melbourne there. Um, just before I'd left, I'd definitely driven one at, at 1.9. I thought, that's a great car, you know. It was good nick and everything. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll get one of them. And over in England, they were dirt cheap in uh, 98. They were a yeah. 10-year-old car then. Yeah. And I'm sure – anyway, he was, he was going to sort me one out and everything, and I met him when I got there, and it was all happening. But I realised within a week or two I don't need a car because I was going to move to London. So it's sort of a bit of a regret that I, I could have got. I'm sure it was two grand. Wow. I'm sure it was thousands, a couple of thousand. Yeah, you know, it was like that. It was almost a flipping car, and it would have been good, Nick. Um, so I never got to, to own one of those. But I, I, I realised London was where I wanted to be, and you just don't need a car. Cars are liability there. So, yeah. and I sort of got into that. I actually, the, the lack of expense, <laughs> car expense. Yeah. And all that, I was actually just totally turned. I thought, oh, okay, I don't want a car. And I even sort of stopped looking at cars. Mm. I was surrounded by amazing stuff in London and I used to notice it, but I wasn't sort of chasing it. I don't know what happened. I just totally flipped the other way, you know. I'm yeah. going to, yeah, I don't know what it was. And there were other things that were taking my time. So, but I definitely see there were a lot of TVRs was a big thing back then. TVR, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, yeah. I remember noticing all that. There were definitely Porsches. I remember being on a National Express bus. It must have been the first month or two I was in England. And I was going up one of the motorways. And I was sort of dozing by the by the window. And I was, it was three lanes. And there was on the outside lane, this thing went past me. It was a Porsche. Um, and literally shook the bus. It felt like it shook the bus, woke me up. And I didn't quite clock what it was, but it was, must have been a fully lit air cooled by the noise of it. Right. 200 mile an hour, just insane. Whatever it was doing, it was just insane. Might have been an early GT3, I don't know. But it was sound like yeah, yeah, this noise I'd never heard before. And you'd see that every so often in England. You'd see these amazing cars. 
Um, and I, we used to get hire cars for work because I'd have to drive to jobs and take a little bit of gear with me. And we get hire cars. Um, and my second job in London was in, around Fleet Street. Yeah. And the hire, to, to, to get the hire car, they'd have to deliver it to me at the office. Um, and two guys would have to come. They'd, or two cars would come. They'd have the car that I'm going to pick up the hire car, then they'd have the other guy that's going to take him back to the place where the yep, depot. Yep. And it turns out our our, our closest depot was um, was um, the city of London, in the city, the, you know, the, the posh bit. Um, and I sort of figured that out pretty quickly. So I started talking to the guys. We don't, I quite often get an upgrade. So our company would just get the cheapest car and I'd end up with a Golf or something, GTI, or not, yeah, not even yeah. GTI, but I'd end up with something better. I clocked that they were bringing me nice cars. I said, well, if I come down to you, I'll save you the trip. I'll get the two tube stops. I'll come down and pick the car up. And, you know, so they started sort of giving me, you know, I was helping them out and they were helping me out. And because it was a nationwide hire company, their system would just book the cheapest car, but their depot just didn't really have the cheapest car. So I remember getting, there wasn't anything supercar. It was, it was, it was just nice. Um, there was Clio's, there was, um, there was turbocharged, Voxels, um, there were definitely Golf GTIs I was getting. Um, so did this start make, make you thinking that you need a car again? Was this a, was this a turning um, point where you started thinking, if I didn't live in London, I could actually start enjoying you yeah, know, this passion again? Yeah, yeah. I started getting it. Was about, that was about three years in. Um, I was in London for about four years, to 2001. Um, we, myself and my, yeah. But when did the, when did the first Porsche come? How well, did that, that come about? That was until 2019. 2019. Yeah. yeah, there's a so big the, yeah yeah there's a big uh, weird time there where they, we I, we came back to Ireland. Uh, my yeah. wife's from Ireland. Uh, we we moved back here in 2002. We got married, built a house in 2003. Um, I had a 306 GTI six. Okay. Uh, it was 2003 2004, and they're about seven or eight years old. Then so they were, and Peugeots here in the UK just the depreciation was incredible on them. Um, yeah, they just dropped through the floor after about five or six years. I don't know. I can't remember what I paid. It wasn't it wasn't a lot, but I um, I had a consulting job here, which meant I had to ride, drive around Ireland, and I'd I'd, I'd I'd always want the big long drives because you got mileage. Um, you get per mile, you get a mileage. So we we're building the house and everything, and I was trying to so I put my my hand up for the big long drives. So I'd be just hooning <laughs> around <laughs> this thing. And quite often, I'd have to come back at two o'clock in the morning, just the nature of the work, night right. surveying things. So I'd. An island at two o'clock is it's empty. Um, yeah, it's it's empty. Um, and this is before the motorways were all finished. So I was coming back on these back roads, this GTI six, which in hindsight was probably some of my best driving, you know, for the money. Um, and that lasted about two years. But then basically babies and uh, marriage and everything. So basically, I just went the um, out of states. Yeah, okay. Volvo. Yeah. I'm okay, involved. so you had the usual cars that a lot of people we all go through. So 2019, yeah. 2019 or 2018. Yeah. yeah. What is that thought that comes into your head? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a real specific because I yeah. – Yeah, then you think, Andy, like, okay, this is – I'm going to look for something. I'm going to look for a turbo. I'm going to go back to that turbo age. What do you start thinking about before you, you know, to get this car? Yeah, well, what it was, I started a business in 2006, my own business, and I, I sold out of that to 20, 2019. Okay. Early 2019, I sold out of that. Right. Um, I just wanted a bit. I was 50. I was 50 at the time. Yeah, I just wanted to step back a bit, you know. And 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 Ireland's quite a cheap place to live. It's quite a good place to live. You don't need you don't need loads of money. It's one of these places. Um, so um, yeah, so I was working away, and I just thought, I don't know. Literally, like most things, I just thought I'm going to buy a sports car. <laughs> I don't know why. I had a I had a I was still driving a Volvo Estate. Right. Sorry, no. So I, by then I had a Merc estate. So it was actually quite okay. a nice one. A nice, it had a bit of power to it. Still the state. Yeah. And I just thought, I'm going to buy a sports car. Um, so I had a bit of a time to drive it. And, um, and I hadn't even thought of Porsche because growing from Australia, rich people own Porsches. Yes. You know this, yeah. Yeah. But over, um, they were exotics and yeah. things to me. They were exotic cars. I put them like a Ferrari almost. Yeah. You know? And probably that probably didn't cost that much difference in Australia to run and everything. And I just started researching on the internet um Porsches and, and and I just thought hang on these aren't that expensive and I thought what's the catch? I started researching the price of parts. Mm. You know, you can get stuff here. Mm. Germany, you can get it direct from Germany and stuff. I thought that's not too bad. 
And yeah, so, you know, so I thought, well, I'll just dip my toe into the water and I was looking at you know, Boxster or Cayman. Uh, yeah. I thought, well, I'm going to buy one and see how I go, you know. Uh, is it going to empty my wallet or not? Um, so I was gonna, almost going to buy a Boxster, actually. Okay. But then I thought, well, I'll, um, I ended up concentrating on Caymans. Yep. So I sort of thought, I just seem to be a bit forgotten about um, for various reasons. I don't know. I think, I think, the, um, I think one of the reasons was obviously the, uh, the bore score. Um, thing. Yeah, there was a lull yeah. there, wasn't there, with the there Cayman? There was, it, yeah. It was, when it first came out, it was like Cayman S, 986, first Cayman S manual was like fetching big dollars, I think, when it came out in Australia, like that was sort of selling over. Then they sort of died off and then all of a sudden now they've they've gone crazy again. So Yeah, yeah. I sort of honed in on because I thought it's a bit of a forgotten about Porsche because it's, fir- it's not their first mid-engine. They've done mid-engines before. Yep. Um, but it was... The nine one two or whatever it is there. That's the yeah, it's the one that's coming for yeah, yeah. But it was sort of their first modern mid-engine car, and I thought, yep. well, this is going to mean something. So, um, so I concentrated on the Gem ones because um, I guess I was just trying to get the cheapest one I could really. Um, and um, I mean the money was there to buy other stuff, but I was just dipping my toe into the water. Um, and there's there's not that many for sale in Northern Ireland, but there was one for sale. Um, but I was also looking at the 997 Gen 1 as well. Okay. There was about 10 grand difference on them, on the right. price. Um, so I'd researched for a few weeks. Um, hadn't got to, I hadn't actually found out about ball score by that stage. Right. right. But there were two I was watching on the classifieds here in Northern Ireland. And one was a, na- uh, a midnight blue Gen 1 Cayman. Right. And the other was a silver Gen 1 997. Um, and it was, it was a Friday. I remember it was a Friday. And I said to my wife, um, well, I've been watching these two cars and they hadn't been selling. And in 2019, what was happening in the UK, Brexit had really knocked some confidence. Yep. Yeah? Yes. And cars were falling. Cars were falling for the last few years. Yeah. They've been falling. So um, this thing wasn't selling. It came in particularly taking photos in a way that it made it look like it was black. The sun was in the wrong spot. It just wasn't a nice. <laughs> a classic, a classic yeah. bad, bad ad. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I just thought, well, I'm going to have a look at this. And it was up in Belfast, a nice part of Belfast. Right. Uh, and, you know, you message away. And even before I got to message him, he dropped the price from 15 to 14,000. And yep. then uh, sorry, by the time I got to look at it, he was at 13,000. I remember that. Wow. I think I was ready to text him at 14 grand. And then. Literally that night, he dropped to 13. I thought, this guy needs to shift it. And, um, you know, he started texting. And, um, and I was also in contact about the Silver 997. Um, anyway, so I thought, well, I'm going to – this was the middle of the week. I thought, well, I'm going get, to get, have a look at these cars. So I said to my wife on the Friday, because I was sort of self-employed, so I was flexible. I said, I'm going to – I said to my wife, I'm going to look at – I'm going to look at a couple of cars. Yep. And she didn't even ask me what they were. <laughs> didn't even ask me what they were. I just said, I'm going to look at a couple of cars today. And uh, so I went up and I looked at the 997 first in the morning. Um, and it just felt tired. It was one of those cars that I could tell it was – it was probably a good car, but it just was tired. Yep. And I could see the money it needed. I was having a look underneath as best I could and everything. And the paperwork wasn't great. And I was almost going to ring the Cayman owner and say, don't bother. I don't, it just put me off the whole thing. I don't know why. Oh, really? Yeah. It was 22, 23 grand, that car, the 997. And okay. there was a bit of a wait. There was a few hour wait between the two appointments. And um, I was sort of having lunch thinking, oh, I don't know if I'm really into this. Yep. Anyway, so I went and I met him at this car park, uh, a nice part of Belfast, and um, he turns up in this midnight blue car, and it was mint, absolutely mint. Oh, really? He was a, Fantastic. He, he was a young solicitor, about 30. He bought an F-Type. Um, he had it coming that week. You know, he needed this thing gone. His parents had had air-cooled all their life. You know, it was a Porsche family, and this car was just immaculate. Um, and even just the way he got into the car, he was very care. you know. So... I bought it. <laughs> you bought it? Sightseeing? <laughs> yeah, I just said, yeah, let's, let's go. How did you check to... it though? How did you check it? You checked it in the car park? Yeah, well, what it was, I there was an independent specialist here that he'd sourced the car for this guy two, I think it was two years before, maybe 18 months okay. before. Okay. And he was a well-known specialist. And so, I mean, I just got a feel about the car and about the owner. And I, when I say I bought it, I paid a deposit. Right. Um, we shook on it. Obviously, I went for a drive and everything, loved it. It's the first Cayman I'd ever driven. You know, that's how, you know. So did but, you, before you picked it up, though, did you do any more checks or you were just happy with you trusted the trusted the seller? Well, I rang the specialist. I rang the specialist um, because what I'd done, I, I knew about the IMS thing, but Caymans, all the Caymans have the stronger IMS. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was the... Because then I was six. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I didn't realise that. I thought there was a certain time. So I was focusing on the IMS thing. Um, didn't even know about ball school. Um, yeah. um, so, you know, I just ran the special and just, he just talked me through and he said, Andy, you know, I bet that car's a really nice tight car to drive. And I said, well, it was. And he said, yeah, well, that's the way we leave. And it, it was a well-looked after car. And because the guy that owned it, his dad had had a lot of cars through the same specialist. Right, right. It was just that history and just seemed to be checking out. So, anyway, so um, I didn't get a PPI, no. No, I didn't. Um, but the confidence is there, though, because of that, yeah, because of the, yeah. the history and because of the other dealer, the other the specialist. Yeah. So you buy the car, you pick it up, yeah, you drive, first drive it back home. How oh, was the first was drive? That was great. I just, um, yeah, it had to, back, yeah. I remember going to the service station to fill it up um, and sort of because walking out of the service station. Mid-engine. Is it, is it manual? Yeah, oh, yeah, manual, yeah. Mid-engine, yeah, manual. 3.4, yeah, the S. It was pretty basic spec in hindsight. Nothing special about the seats. Just had the didn't have many options. Um, Midnight blue was did look nice. Um, yeah, I love that color. Yeah, when it's clean, it's an amazing color. Um, yeah, it is a lovely color. Um, it used to be called dark blue metallic. That was the, they changed the name to Midnight blue <laughs> okay. around then. But it was um, I didn't know any of this to see when I bought it. I just so, thought I'm going to go. So, I'm going to go have a little bit court. But I messaged my wife. So, I, messaged, I messaged my wife. Um, yeah. When I was driving back from putting the deposit down, I said, oh, I've just bought a Porsche. I don't know what her response was. Um, she'll probably listen to this, so I'm not going to say, but I don't know. It wasn't, I was, yeah, I was a bit surprised. Okay. I, think. I said, look, I've just, I've just bought a Porsche. That's basically what I said. I'd left in the morning saying, I'm going to look at a few cars, and I bought one. But it took a week to pick it up, you know. And that's but it's a thing. weird feeling, though, isn't it? And sorry, it's a weird feeling, isn't it? Because like you said, you know, it's it's a we always, we kind of see it as a posh car, you know, yeah. you know, like being in Australia or Tasmania, you know, we see it as a posh car and then all of a sudden, and I've said this to other owners as well, as soon as you get your first one, you're in it. It's weird, isn't it? You know, whether mm. it be a 911 or a Cayman, it's, it's weird that you're actually, cause it's kind of like, I've got a Porsche, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it just becomes so familiar, you know, you kind of forget, it just well, becomes I, so familiar. Well, walking out of the service, I paid for the petrol and I had to fill it up and, and I remember walking out going, oh, that's my bloody car over there. You know, that was a, it was one of the cheaper Porsches you get, but people yeah. didn't know that. It's yeah. really weird the reaction you used to get. Um, but even on the test drive, that's the first flat six I'd ever driven. Right. I'd never driven a flat six engine apart from the test drive. And within two minutes, I was hooked. So um, that's where it all totally started. Hooked. Yeah. But that's yeah. where it all started. So did you have, are there any flashbacks when you're doing that drive back back home of, of the Cordia or um, the Starion? Like, um, are you thinking like, wow, this is, yeah. this is chalk and cheese or... Um, oh, no, I couldn't remember that well. I remember the Starion would be quite often hanging the back of it out, <laughs> and you don't really do that with a, cord, a Cayman. Um, it actually started to rain halfway back home. It was about a fifty, about a one-hour trip, maybe. And you know, halfway home it was a, it was a Friday when I picked it up, following Friday, and it just started to rain. So it actually got a bit heavy towards the second half. And I'm going right. down these. I picked all these B roads to try it out, yep. and I was getting more and more confident because the, the grip is just another level on these cars. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I'd had an MX-5 actually with a friend. Okay. Actually, that's actually that's what it was. Actually, you know that's what that was. It was in 2019. A friend of mine was always buying and selling cars, and he said to me, Andy, this is before I bought the the Porsche. He said, Oh, do you want to come to this little rally we do called Rusty Nuts? Right. So we have to buy a 500 pound car, and they do a three day rally around the. It's not dirt. It's just around the roads fundraiser. Yeah. So we bought this Mark One MX-5. Okay. For 500 quid. Wow. Cheap. The guy wanted a grand. It was worth more than that even then. We don't know how we got it for 500. Um, yeah. And it was actually a really nice car. It was modified. Yeah. Um, a bit tired, but it was modified. So, yeah, that, so that's what actually got – that was actually it. Yeah, that's what that got me back it. in. Yes. I had so much fun in that car um, for three days, and we sold it for a grand. <laughs> wow, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so 2019, 2019 yeah, so, though, you've got the Porsche. Yeah. You know, you haven't had a, a, a sports car for, for some time. Yeah, right? for a long time, yeah. So it's only 2022 – that car, how long did you keep the car for? Because you it's, must have sold it reasonably quickly. Ex- exactly a year. Yeah. A year. So my idea was I'm going to buy this thing. I mean, I was looking at GT3s then, you know. Okay. Um, I was looking at the other stuff. But in Northern Ireland, you can't just jump – well, you can jump on a plane and go and try. But you don't get GT3s. couldn't line up two or three to try in Northern Ireland. It just doesn't happen. Um, okay. The population is just not here. So I would have had to go to England to try out cars and things like that. <clears throat> so um, – I don't know if it was quite a GT3 looking then, but I was definitely looking at better, more expensive cars. But I just thought I'll buy this one and see how I go for a year or even six months. Yeah. Um, 
but so you what happened it. was you like the Porsche thing. You yeah. like the Porsche thing. This got you into it, though, right? This is but what within got you a few into it. months, I thought, well, I can't put my head around this expense and, and how it all works and insurance on the Cayman. It was it's the cheapest of our three cars to insure. We had an Audi, a Mercedes, and the Cayman was the cheapest car. Okay, so yeah. with the Cayman, though, right? With the 06, you got the Cayman S. It's manual, sought after. You know, people people want them. You know, they're they're not yeah. they're a great car. Was there not enough power there for you? I mean, are you a, are you a tr- you're not are you not a full track guy though? Are you? You're not no, someone no. looking oh, no, for track guy. Like, you like to do no, the road no. the road driving, don't you? You like to do the tours, yeah. like you just did the tour to, to Scotland. Those yeah, sort yeah. of cars you're looking <coughs> for. So is that how the next car comes along? That you you really like these mid engine yeah. Porsches? Yeah. Well, what happened was I I was in Australia, so I bought this Cayman in October, and then January. From a month in January to February 2020, I was in Australia. Okay. I took my youngest son there. I try to go every year. And <clears throat> so February, mid-February, I'm still in Australia, 2020 this is. Yep. And I'm looking at cars every night. That's just the way I am. I'm looking at cars in England, you know, all the yep. time, wherever I am. And I'm trying to figure out what the next move one was then. And I was looking at GT3s, you know, 997 GT3s, because they weren't, they hadn't, they, I, I figured out they were just underpriced. I remember thinking, why are these cars, why are they that price? Yep. And in hindsight, I was right, you know. Um, and I'd organised with a mate to go to England in March or in spring when I got back. We we're going to go in spring and do a drive and do a round. And, yep. and that was spring 2020. And we, <laughs> spring it's what happened, COVID. Yep. Yeah. So that didn't happen. And even over April, there were definitely GT3s and stuff going. There was a bit of panic selling for a month or two. Prices were lower. Slightly. Australia and yeah. UK prices were lower. Yeah, there was a bit of a panic. Yeah. Well, a lot of a panic. Um, yeah. And I, but I hadn't driven one. I remember thinking I might hate this thing. I might prefer the Cayman. I, I just hadn't made my, and I thought the market was coming my way. I thought it was going to get worse and worse. Yep. Right. Yep. That didn't happen. No. So, um, so I'd sort of thought, well, oh, okay. I, I sort of missed that little window there, but I couldn't get over to try them out. And buying cars blind then wasn't even as big as it was now, you know, you, you it's sort of a norm almost now. In a couple so, of years, in a couple of yeah. years, people become very comfortable with online. Yeah, which I mean, I even when you think Teslas, to. Teslas, you know, let's talk about electric cars, but Teslas when they were sold online, people were a bit hesitant. How could yeah. you want to sell it online? You know, yeah, yeah. And now it's like people just do it for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, if I'd have known Millions that, of dollars. I, you know, there were definitely, yeah. But it was a nine nine seven. I just thought, well, I don't know. I just focused on that. I hadn't driven one. I, I did look at the nine nine six GT three, but everyone was sort of saying, well, now it's a nine nine seven. You know, that was the way. Um, so anyway, so I, I summer come or summer here, yep. uh, which would have been July, um, yep. and prices are popping up. They, everything's gone up. You know, all this money being thrown around, and I thought, oh no, this, this is going the wrong way. You know, my upgrade path is disappearing. <laughs> so, um, but I was aware of the Cayman R when I had the Cayman. So you know, generally when I look at a car, I was like, what's the best or the best spec in any model you've got and the Cayman R found that pretty quickly after I bought my Cayman yes. so I was definitely eyeing those off but with an eye on a GT3 as well um, but even the Cayman R they were a good one of those we were selling very quickly but um, hard to find though Andy so hard yeah. to find the Cayman R they hardly um, come up anymore uh, you, in England you'll always find one or two manuals with the right stuff they'd normally, want, they'd normally get one or two around if you're prepared really? to pay yeah um, yeah yeah there's always a few floating around but I had in my mind I wanted one with a few miles on it. Right. A lot of people seem to want 30,000 30, miles or less. I just don't understand. Yep. Um, and I was happy to get a 50, 60,000 mile. I just didn't, you know, I just thought I'm going to get one for a certain price. I had a certain price in my head. And people with Cayman R said, well, you're not going to get a Cayman R for that with the bucket seats and the manual and the sports exhaust, all the options. Um, and I'd almost given up on getting one. Um, and it, was, it was September 2020. Um, prices were going up. What happened in England was there was a second lockdown yes. looming. Yes. So summer, our English summer 2020, people thought we were, we were past the worst of it. Yep. And there was a bit of frenzy there, buying frenzy, put prices up. And then... Closed down. Uh, yeah, the whole thing. By October, they were shutting down by November, really. So so I was, um, I'd be on a lot of Facebook groups for these car models, um, and they're really good in England, actually. And a lot of cars get advertised there or people put them on and just say, I'm thinking of selling this. Yep. What do you think? And they'll put a price to it. And I was sort of always keeping an eye on those. And it was, it was definitely Friday afternoon. I was working away. 
with my eye on the Facebook groups as I do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and this this thing comes up. It's uh, it's a guy. He didn't have a Porsche, but he was selling it for his dad. It was a Cayman R. Wow. 2011 Cayman R, white. It was one owner. His yep. dad had bought it. His dad was 72. Right. When he was selling it. He just put it up, said, here's Cayman R, listed the options. I'm selling this for my dad. Um, he put a price to it. Oh, I won't say. But um, And I, I, I looked twice. Like, Is that right? I, don't remember the price. I thought, that's, that's not right. <laughs> and I was uh, quickly scanned it again. And, and I probably was about five minutes after being posted that I'd seen it and I could see the comments were just going, hitting it. It was hitting like mad. So the price was low or high? Yeah, it was low. about 20% under, I reckon. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So how least, long, So you had to be quick then. You could see the comments coming up. And yeah. You go. Well, I just met, I didn't put a comment. I just messaged, I said, um, here's my number. I'm buying it for myself, not to flip. Okay. Was, you know, just, and I thought, well, I've missed the chance. This guy's, you know, it's going to get, it's bored already. Um, and he messaged back saying, I'm going to ring you back. I'm just, there's, there's two ahead of you. I'm ringing you back. I thought, oh, you never know. He did ring me back about what, 20 minutes later. Yep. Um, and the first person he got on the phone was a dealer who tried to, <laughs> tried to, under, tried to take them off the price. Wow. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, the second person was a chancer. And right. luckily I was there. I was the third one. And once I got him on the phone, I thought, well, I'm not going to let you go. You know? So I was asking him all the questions. So his father had ordered a, a Cayman GTS, the four liter had come out. Yes. Uh, sorry, the, the six cylinder four liter had come out. Yes. Um, because he told me his dad had rung him one day because his dad was old school. He'd read the, he used to read magazines, not the internet. And he rung him a few months before going, Oh, they've put a, they've really re released a six cylinder Cayman. It used to yep. be a four liter turbo. And he's all excited. So I'm going to order one. So he went and ordered one. And um, that must have been you know, August, I think it was. And they said, Oh, your car's not coming till January. But what had happened, um, people were cancelling orders back then. It's a funny oh, okay. time. There were new orders were getting cancelled, and he'd got a phone call saying your car's coming in. I think two weeks. They said it's been brought forward to October. Yes, and he was seventy-two, so he maybe he panicked a bit and said to me, "Someone, can you get rid of the Cayman R?" Because he didn't have space for these two cars. Um, so that sort of seemed to be what it was. And he basically, um, yeah. So I got on the phone, you know, went through everything. I said, "Well, look, I'll I'll send you five hundred quid now. Deposit. I'm gonna, you know, the fact that he rung me and he knew I was in Northern Ireland amazed." Okay, yep. so what was yeah. the? Tell the listeners exactly what this car was. So it's a, it's well, a 2011 Cayman R. Yeah, it had 53,000 miles when I bought it, which was apparently high miles. <laughs> These cars it has ridiculous. the buckets, right? Bucket seats. It's got the um, so it's manual bucket seats. It had the Porsche Sports PSE, um, which is important on those cars because the PSE on the Cayman R was actually a bigger bore exhaust than the Cayman S okay. PSE. It costs a lot of money to try and buy it after the fact. It's a 55 mil uh, pipe diameter versus 48. Right. That was part of the way they they they, they only got another 10 horsepower out of the tune. Um, part of that was exhaust, but mainly it was just a map. Um, 10 horsepower is not much, but um, it had um, didn't have the sports chrono, but it had the three key things, which was a manual, the buckets, and the sports exhaust. Yep. It was white, which is a it's Carrara white, which is a, is a nice color in those cars. The it's black a nice trim. color. Yeah, you need the it's got the black bits on it, you know. So it just seems to work on that. I'm not a big fan of white normally, but it just yeah. worked on that car. Everyone chases after that green color, don't they? I can't remember. Yeah, I nearly bought one. Um, yeah, nearly bought one of those. That, that was definitely was one of those in the market in um, more a lot more money, but I just couldn't quite. Yeah, because the, they've got the color coded center console. They've got color coded yes. bits inside the Cayman R. Yes. Not just the console, it's bits on the dash. And I just I wasn't sure if I could live with green. I don't know what yeah, the white actually probably works better, doesn't it? Yeah. So, how yeah. do you, so you've already given the deposit to the guy. You've yeah, got the yeah. history with the 06 987.1 Cayman S. Yeah. So then now you put a deposit down on a 2011, right? 2011 yeah, yeah. Cayman R. So the Cayman yeah. R is. You know, it's a different league, right? It's 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 before the GT4. It's 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 you know like Porsche starting to work out that they can do more with with the Cayman. You know what I mean with the Boxster and the Cayman. Yeah. So how do you how do you make sure this car's okay? Do you go yeah, and view it yourself, or you get that specialist you used before? How do you go about it, Andy? Yeah, well, that's the thing. I I can't believe he was that patient because he had a queue of people wanting to buy it on his doorstep. You know, but he's, he's obviously old school, and his father was old school. His his work, you know, his work with his. You know, he, he, was, he knew I, what I think it was. But he'd sold he'd sold a, an escort to someone in Northern Ireland very recently, and it was a really good deal. I think he realised when we hit something, we hit it really hard and don't muck about. Yep. So anyway, so basically what I did, I uh, paid the 
500 quid. I maybe sent another 500 quid. So I'm definitely you know, serious. And I organised a PPE. It took about a week to get the yep. PPE, yep. PPI. Sorry, um, that was done. I didn't fly over to look at the car. Um, one of the reasons I wanted the PPI was to talk to the person, to saying how fresh is this car? Does it feel as fresh as it looks? The interior, in particular. Um, if you've got a tired interior, I think it's very hard to bring that back. Sorry, um, Andy, where's the car located? Sorry, yeah, it was in Chester in England. Oh, in Chester, okay. Yeah, I should say that. You're just outside Manchester, really. Um, yep. So, uh, and that's quite a good area. A few friends have bought cars. That was only in Chester. I don't know. They're, they're There's good cars around that Manchester. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen them come up too. Yeah. Yeah, it's you'll special find cars. that. There's um, money there, money in that region. There's money right? there, yeah. And that's why, again, and also the ferry, to get it across from Holyhead, it's, a, it's only a two-hour trip to the ferry to bring it across to Dublin. Whereas some parts of it, they're not going to be driving seven hours, you know. So it, it just all worked. But in, yeah, but the PPI, um, so the guy took it in. They had four Cayman, three other Cayman R's they look after, three or four. Right. And he said, well, this one's the freshest one we see. Oh, fantastic. Um, he said, so that another was one that's in, yeah. That and was I said, enough. what's the interior like? And I, he said, this thing is like new. And this, the, the owner was 72. It was quite a, you know, fr- quite a small guy. And what yep. he was doing, he actually had Lotus Europas. He was a oh, car okay. guy. And this Cayman R was just the car that he used to drive from his house to the, his, where, his, his workshop 20 miles away a couple right. of times a week. Right. He used to take it on cr- cruises and that. But, but generally, that was what he did. And he, he even had the, the seats covered. Because he might have slightly grubby uh, clothes on the way yeah, at the yeah, end of the day, yeah. so he'd park so inside well there. Yeah, yeah. Well but it wasn't. A, I don't think it was garage all the time though. I don't think he didn't really garage it and all that. So it wasn't like that sort of car. It wasn't a garage clean, but it been used. But he's a great guy, and he had a couple of Europas. I never got to see them. Um, they were modified. He used to race those. He didn't race the Cayman R. I mean, the Cayman R isn't. It's a lot of people think it's a Mini GT3, but it's not. It's not. There's no. Um, so yeah. before we go there, though, how did you get it back then? Do you come? Do you come over to? You, do you come over to the to London and, and pick it up, or what do you do? Yeah, so we we uh, made me and a mate come across. So we drove down to Dublin ferry during um, COVID, though. Yeah, so this was October. So it took actually two weeks to pick it up. So we got the PPI done, and I'd paid a load of money with a balance getting paid on the day. Yep. So it was bought. It was basically bought. Unless there was yes. something crazy going on in the day. Yep. So it took two weeks. So it was into October, and the and the second lockdown was basically on the on the eve of it. Happening. So we yeah. got on this ferry. We got on, me and my mate on this ferry from Dublin to Holyhead, England, and it was ghost town. Yeah. It was just it was a really weird feeling. We got the train, picked up the car, um, had a good chat. It was a really good, really good day. It was a Friday, and then drove it back to Holyhead on the Friday for the late the last ferry on the Friday, an empty ferry. Just, just wow. It was just a really, really so weird did, place. Yeah. How did it feel? <laughs> How did it feel? Because you got the, you got your, yeah. you, you, you've got rid of your previous one, right? You've sold the Cayman S. I had that still, so I was going to run the two together okay. for a month. Yeah, just the way it was working. Um, what did you notice straight up did though, I notice, when you, when you drove? I tell you what I noticed. I tell you what I noticed. Was Is it the weight? Um, well, one, one thing I noticed was it's quieter inside the cabin because the Gen two engine. Yeah, the Gen two engine doesn't have the induction noise of a Gen one. Ah, okay. The DFI engine on the Gen two, and the same thing for the nine nine seven is very different induction and they've lost some of that character oh. yeah so, so yeah. what so did you think what the you know like is was that something i just that... thought well the psc so my existing cayman the first cayman i had didn't have sports exhaust so but it used to have more just general noise about it whereas so i put the sports exhaust on straight away and i thought well i can live you know that's all right i guess it's sort of it's more noise outside than inside. That's yep. the first thing I noticed. But I mean, I did have, I noticed the the handling was sharper. They 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 they're lighter. I mean, they talk about this fifty five kilos lighter, but they're not really there. As long as you get a manual, um, but they have air conditioning, so you're more like about 40, 35 kilos lighter. That's quite Much, a lot, though, don't you think? Like normally when they do weight reduction, yeah. it's fifteen kilos or something. It's it's still quite a big chunk of weight. Yeah, but what you're feeling, it's actually what you're feeling is they have a bespoke stiffer suspension. Right on the Cayman R, that the Cayman S didn't have. Right. So what you you're feeling the weight, but I think more what I was feeling was the stiffer suspension. So everything was just happening torter. Yeah. Um, I mean the Cayman R has, and the other thing I noticed was the, the Cayman R has the GT3 aluminium doors. Yeah. So when you open the door of a 
came and ah, it's half, it feels like it's half the weight of an S. That's the first thing I noticed. And I, and I still notice it today uh, when I go up to a normal came and how heavy the door feels. So that's where they so, shed a lot of the weight then from the doors. That's where they yeah, got most well, of the Yeah, what happened weight. was, I think in two, basically in 2011, the Cayman R seems to be getting this legendary status, which it, it deserves, yes. but, but what it really – it wasn't a limited numbers car. It was limited because – Limited production though, right? It was only no, produced for a short period, wasn't it? Yeah, but it was a run-out model. Yeah, it was like the end of the end of the Caymans, right? End yeah, of the, yeah. So what they were trying to do was avoid people hanging out to buy the 981. They wanted to shift the, the, the 987. But they would have made 10,000 of them if people wanted them. But the problem oh, was, right. no, in 2011, that was the worst of the economy. Yes, yes. So they ended up making two or 3,000, maybe 3,000, not by choice. They would have made as many as you wanted. So, um, But it will uh, go down though, Andy. Sorry. It will go yeah. down, I think, in years to come. Even we can see it yeah. now. That it, it's, it's a really special car for Porsche. It it's still going to become is. one of those really special cars for Porsche. And people kind of, it's one of those weird things, again, where people kind of overlooked it. And I remember seeing the prices yeah. in Australia, and I've spoken about this before, where it dipped. You know, they yeah. dipped. Yeah. And then I remember seeing one at Classic Throttle Shop in Sydney in the green. And I can't even remember how much it was, but it was, it was you know, probably three times as much as what they were selling for. You know what I mean? Like it would really? double. It was, it was crazy money. You know, and you think, okay, something's changed here. Someone, you know, the whole feeling of this car has changed. For you, yeah. though, for you, though, when you start driving it, when you start driving it, you said, you, you know, you could, the induction noise is not as, as strong, whatever. But when, when was the first time when you, when you take it back to Northern Ireland and you're driving it and you think, okay, I have got something special here? What was the thing well, that sort of made you think it was, it was, it was special? Um, it was after I modified it. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. You had to still, you had to tweak it. Uh, what it was, um, that's a good question. I mean, uh, yeah, it felt special from day one because what it is, you sit in these bucket seats and you've got, um, you've got the special steering wheel as well, the, the nice steering wheel. So the whole, the whole fight, once you sit in a bucket seat, you feel different before you even start the car and even opening the doors feels different. Yes. It just feels like it's, yeah. Um, oh no, straight away I fell for it. hundred percent fell for this car. Um, but, with okay. me, I tend to start researching what do people do. So it had a bit of a flat spot in the mid-range. Okay. Um, and they, that seems to be a thing. I think it's more an em, emissions thing. They have to sort of tune things a bit funny, yeah. Um, so I knew I was going to get rid of that, and I was researching mapping straight away um, um, and also exhaust modifications. But, yeah, I mean, from the, from the very I mean, from the very first drive home – actually, I'll tell you what it was, actually, yeah – Really, I couldn't really do much in England um, because I just didn't know the whole camera thing. And, yeah, from Chester to Hollyhead, I was just sort of cruising. with My, my mate was in the car. And I remember he I was trying to teach him how to get into a bucket seat properly. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was sort of – With your sort of perfect guided, seats. With your oh, perfect seats. a certain seats. technique to it. And, <laughs> and I remember going to McDonald's. We had to stop at McDonald's. And I thought, oh, this is going to be desperate. And uh, he sort of – on purpose, he got in wrong. I just knew that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I've had enough of this. But um, we got to the ferry anyway. But it wasn't until um, I got off the ferry and there's a tunnel out of Dublin going north and he was in his car, just a SUV, yep. ahead of me and I just gave this thing the guns in the tunnel and just heard the sound and everything. And he, I went past him. He just said, it sounded fantastic. And it was that, you know, once I got home and knew my own roads, then I really had a yeah. go at it and I just thought, this is great. It's just the, it's the agility of it and it's not just – Maybe it's half. I don't even think it's the weight. It's, it's definitely the suspension. So the shocks are a lot more stiff. The, the shocks and springs on that car, are, that's the only suspension component they change. There's nothing right. – there's no special bushings or anything on the suspension members. So right. it's not a GT thing in that way. Um, so really one of the – probably the main things about that car, I think historically, will be the GT3 doors. Right. It's a body panel thing that was very unique. Yes. Um, and when that car came out, because 2011 – GT products weren't selling. I think they just no. raided the GT parts bin because the seats on that car are out of a GT2. Yes. The reclining uh, yeah, the they folding were, buckets, right? Even the 997 Gen 1 wouldn't have been – some of the 997s didn't have those seats. It was a really special seat and they're big money now. Yes. Um, they're an amazing look. It's when you walk up to the car, um, it's got the body kit as well, which was a – wasn't just bespoke for the Cayman R. So that, all these things add up. There's probably a dozen things they've done. Little things like they took the um, the off the door, the bottom edge of the door, you know, the 
the scuttle, the, the scuff thing, yep. whatever. The, yeah, that's just like a sticker. It's just all these little things they took off, and it all adds up to a special sort so of thing. So you see it yeah. as being body colored, don't you? It's that whole thing where it's yeah. body colored, isn't it? Yeah. The center console is body colored, the, the yes. trim is body colored, and the door sills are yeah. body colored um, with the print. So what, what did you. Okay, let's just go back to the modifications because I know the listeners are waiting for me to ask. So what did you actually do though? You said that basically you can see the the potential in this car, right? You think it's a great car, but you want to yeah. tweak it. You want to get some more out of it. So what were the just the key things quickly, Andy, what you did to that car? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, even before I bought the Cayman R, I was looking at the Gen 2 Cayman S. Right. I actually, actually nearly bought one actually, an aqua blue one, but I, I didn't. I don't know. But um, I wanted to go to the Gen 2 because I'd already had the Gen 1. I thought, well, I'm going to go to the Gen 2. Yep. <clears throat> That's what you do, you know. Um, so I knew about the DFI. So I was doing a lot of research in before I had the Cayman R. Um, and really what happens with the DFI engines, they're a good, tough engine, but um, you, you basically a map and the headers, so the the, the exhaust headers, the, the um, I call them headers, um, you know what I mean, the, yeah, yep. the bit straight out of the block. Um so in the, in the in the Gen Two, the S and the R, the headers have two cats in each header. Right. Um, whereas the Gen One used to have one cat in the headers and one cat in the back box. Um, but in the Gen Two, all the headers are loaded up at the front. Uh, the headers. Um, <clears throat> and I sort of, I mean, the first day I had the car back, I had it up on my stands and I was underneath looking at it. And I, I saw the headers and I thought. Oh, if you, I don't know if you if you ever see the Gen Two headers, they 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 look weird. Right. Um, they they just look weird. It's almost like they've they might, they've always got a reason for what they've done, but it just looks weird. Um, and I just thought they don't look very nice, you know. So um, <clears throat> I had in my head that I was going to get some um, race uh, headers with the racing cats, which are a more open header, a more open cat, just less restrictive. Yep. Um, so I was sort of pricing all that around. But what I did in the was um, I got a map, and because I'm in Northern Ireland, the map is over here. Wouldn't really be Porsche guys. If I was in England, there's a handful of people I could have taken that car to and done a rolling map. Yes. Um, but I just didn't have that option. I didn't want to go. That. So I ended up getting a Softronic map from America. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. He he. I actually talked to the guy as well. He's really good. Um, and <clears throat> I, I actually got that. You laid that yourself. Um. And I straight away, I, I picking the mid range. I really noticed the mid range straight away. Okay. Um, that was with the standard exhaust, so that was definitely worth doing. Um, he actually sent me two maps. One had this pops and bangs. <laughs> oh really? So you you could choose. So you picked the not the pops and bangs one. Well, no, I did actually. Oh, you I did? did? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, okay, so you, I had the two the files map. there. I had the two files. I thought, which one will I load? <laughs> and I thought, I'll put the pops and bangs on for a week. It was on for like three months. Um, it was hilarious. But, but you do the map um, and then you've got to yeah. do the exhaust, right? You have to do the yeah. exhaust. Yeah, so I felt I felt um, it was just more eager in the mid-range and probably more t- and top end as well, but definitely the mid-range. I felt the mid-range, I could do things in third gear that I would have had to drop down to second straight away. So it was definitely, it's a good map. You know, he's it, 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 very popular even over here. Right. But um. But then I was looking at headers and on Facebook, um, so Soul Performance would be a really common name now. Yes, um, they have one. But, they're, yeah, it's quite pricey really. Um, and I was looking at all the options and, and, and on Facebook Marketplace, a set of um, catless headers came up for a Cayman Gen right. 2. So right. there's no cats at all. Um, <clears throat> and they're half price and they've only been used for a year. And the, the person selling was a really good, you know, really, really good guy. Yep. I just bought them. Um, I think that's 650 pound, you know. Um, so I got those over and um, we got those. I didn't fit those myself because of the, I just worried about the corroded fittings you get with these 10-year-old Porsche. So I got a guy to replace all the fittings and everything while we did it. Yes. So that really took the car to another level. Um, How was the sound? The sound is – um, it's loud, yeah, yeah. So I got the PSC, so I can turn that on and off. Um, okay, so that's good. But again, another mod I did literally the first week was I disconnected the whole PSE. So it was basically always on. You disconnect that solenoid controller in the, um, in the, in the engine bay. It's a five minute job. Um, but yeah, so they were, they okay. were, it was always on. So it's quite, um, it gets a bit droney at two and a half or 3000 revs with those headers. Um, but just so the listeners know, you still yeah. have this car, right? You, you know, we're going to yeah. get into your latest car, which we're going to yeah. run out of time, but we're going to get into your latest right, car. Sure, yeah. But um, the, the Cayman R is not a car you, you're not going to get rid of it, are you? You're going to keep it? 
I'm I'm actually selling it. Yeah. You are selling it. It's the reason I'm selling. It, I've only got one garage, but there's a guy that from the day I bought it, a guy in that sort of car group, he wanted first dibs on it. Okay. And um, yeah, we've we've agreed a price, and I'm I'm prepared to let it go, but I want to know where it is, and I might want to buy it one day. Is okay. That sort of a thing. It's staying I in thought you would have kept that one. I'm surprised. I wanted to. I wanted to, but I tell you. Um, but you've just made a big investment with your new car. Yeah. We're not going to talk values, but you made. You know, it's a big investment. Yeah. So it kind of makes sense. And also, I'll be doubling up. The, the Cayman is fairly harsh on the road. Okay. The the for a ride and really, I'm going to end up with two cars the same. Okay. Let, I want to get yeah. into the GT3 though because you know yes. we're, going, we're going to be way over here, but we just want to get into the GT3. I don't want everyone to lose lose concentration and not and turn off you know three quarters of the way through, <laughs> which they do. Yeah. Um, so what else? So you you did the you, so apart from those things on the Cayman R, is that all you you did to it? Yeah, that's all I need. Yeah. That's all you need, and then it was it takes to about three hundred fifty horsepower. Uh, yeah. And you know, you drive this car a lot. You're out and about all the time. I'm going to say about the 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 Instagram that you started up, the uh, Porsche Drivers Island, right? Yeah. So you said you set that up in during COVID. Yeah, that was uh, about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Group. Yeah. Your group. Um, not a club. But yeah, group. <laughs> yeah, it's an informal group. <laughs> so I'm going to share that. I'm going to share that Instagram now, and I'm going to show you. Sure, your, yeah. your, so that Instagram is, and I'll find it. It's at Porsche. Uh, Porsche underscore drivers underscore island. So go and check that one out. That's the, well, you can explain it, Andy. That's the group you set up basically just for drives you're doing with a whole lot of other guys around. Yeah, around I just want to go. Right? Yeah. I mean, the first drive we did, I thought only a couple of car, well, I thought only two cars would turn up, but a few GT3s turned up out of nowhere. So that's sort of how it started. So you get all sorts of cars coming and um, we just drive. Yeah. Fantastic. Nothing about big meals or anything, just drive. Early morning as well. And don't worry about the miles. So let's get into the let's get into the GT3, right? Mm. <clears throat> the listeners will see what you've got. It's in the title, and it's special. It and, is, yeah. And I need you to you, to like really explain this because I don't know a lot about about Manti racing. You know, I know I know the you know the Manti racing now, and I don't know the history of it and and the history of this car. And you sent me a lot of information, and I know it's a beautiful car, and I want you to you know tell the listeners how it came about. Mm. Um, so. It was what, only a few months ago that you realized this car could be available? Just tell the listeners how it came about, Andy. Yeah, well, probably because, yeah, well, originally two years ago, I was going to look at GT3s and I put it out of my head. I just came back a few months ago and in my head, I'm thinking, well, I need a 911. You just have to have a 911 at some start. You just do. Yeah. And we come back from Scotland, this big trip, and I'd been following nine 911s, air-cooled and all sorts, and just thought, oh, God, it ruined me. So... Um, <laughs> So what I did was I on the Facebook group for 996 GT3s, I just put a post up saying anyone got any any GT3s going, modified mileage, I don't care. Yes. And I thought I was going to get just laughed at as if to say, yeah, I'm going to hope and buy one, mate. Within a day, I had four. Okay. The cars, they went on the market. They were being offered to me right. in England. Yeah, they went wow. on the market. Um, but one guy, he was actually an, an Irish guy. He had a. He said, "I've got a 996 GT3 Manti," and I didn't know what he meant. Yeah. Um, it was a black one. Um, so I started googling Manti, thinking, "Oh, okay, that's what this is all about." Because I'd seen MR, the MR on the new ones, right? On the yeah, GT2s Manti racing and, and the record yeah. break breaking GT2 MR. Yeah. You know. Yep. So yeah, so Olaf Manti started 1996. Um, and he started modifying the GT3s fairly quickly, but um, but in terms of the how I got it, so so this Manti Racing came up. There was this one in Limerick, and I put a post. There's a big forum here, Piston Heads. Yes, the English. Yeah, I look at it all the time. Yeah, there was. Uh, I started searching Manti and that, and there was an old thread about a Manti Racing car from years ago, and I posted a picture of this one in Limerick. <clears throat> I said, "Does anyone know about this car?" And one guy well-known to Piston Head, said, well, I don't know about that one, but I know two that are coming up for sale soon. Right. So I messaged him. And what happened was the car that I ended up buying, the Speed Yellow Gen 1 Manti, was one of the two cars he'd heard of. Okay. Uh, this guy had had four or five of them. He, was, he just seemed to know what was going on in that scene. And someone who'd had this Speed Yellow one had emailed him literally the day before, said, uh, I think I'm going to sell my car for various reasons 
So that was 24 hours before I put this post up. And so basically um, that's how the connection happened with this car that wasn't on the market. So basically I had six cars that weren't on the market being known to me. Wow. Which is interesting, I thought. And I guess yeah. I guess a lot of owners, though, it's like when you think about you want to sell your car, you don't really, you don't want the hassle, right? You don't. Yeah. yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? You know what I mean? So if you can just list yeah. on a forum where there's like-minded people mm. and then just, you know, if, if you someone lists and then they say they're looking for something, then maybe like, you know, maybe you'll say, okay, I have one. I might be interested in selling. I guess that's just, yeah, it's just that's easy. Exactly it's what just happened. easy with enthusiasts, right? Yeah. So Manti Racing, like you said, is the... MR, isn't it? The MR on the new cars. Yeah. You know, um, it's, owned when, by, it's owned by Porsche now, right? It's 50, I think it's over 50% owned by Porsche yeah. now. And it's not owned by um, Manti anymore, Olaf, is it? It's owned by two other guys, I think. I can't remember their names. Yeah. When, when, the, when they were doing the GT3s, it was actually called Manti Motors. Right, right. And at some stage, it went to Manti Racing, and then Porsche bought an ownership of it. I think they just had to get them under their wing. Um, so, but Olaf himself was a successful race driver yes so we had some porsche. That in him. porsche race driver right yeah yeah um but what they basically do is they they do three things they map them but they fit a an exhaust basically made by m&m um a really really good exhaust but the main one of the main things they do is they fit um they basically put a cup type induction system on it so they rip the air box out they take the mass airflow sensor out the math sensor comes out they put a cup BMC type filter on it. So there's not much between the induction system and fresh okay. air. And they also put a carbon fiber air guide um, into the engine bay to stop the hot air getting into the, you know. So um, I think you'll probably post a photo which will show what I mean. But it's. Yeah, it's a real enthusiast car, right? It, yeah. it, it's super enthusiast. It's like, you know, we all want one. So you've got this, you've got this car that comes up. Right, you got this car that comes up. Does the guy contact you? You contact him. It was what the story was. He hadn't. He was only. He wasn't fully there about selling it yet. He was still. He was still. There's a long story behind it, but it took him a few weeks to realise he, he sort of needs to sell it. It wasn't okay. financial. It was just there was other things. Yeah. Um. So there was a few weeks where I talked to him pretty quickly, and he was saying, "Andy, it's not. I'm not sure I'm selling this yet, but I'm going to talk to you about it." He was okay. probably eighty percent there. So there was a few okay. weeks where it wasn't even officially, you know, and then. Um, that happened, then he basically said, oh, okay, it's de- I'm definitely selling it. Yes. I know now. I've, I've made my men's, you know. So then it came down to price, and then we organised PPE. It took a, took over a, a month, at least that stage of it. So it could have fallen down any time. You know, it, this this could have fallen down any time. Um, so obviously that was a car I got a PPI on, um, compression okay, so test. He makes, yeah. Just go back a bit, Andy. So he, deci- mm. he decides to sell it, right? I know the story, but he decides to sell it. Yeah. So what do you do? You just on the you you are fully decided then, right? You're going to take this car. How do you go about it? Because it's a bit of a process involved here. So just yeah. tell the listeners the process that you went through to to actually get the car and pick up the car. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what happened? Right. So we agreed a price that we were both happy enough with, um, and I agreed to fly over. I'm going to get PPI done. Yes. So the the airport he picked me up from, he picked me up on the car and I used to go off the plane and walk to the car and he was parked in the McDonald's <laughs> car park. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, I told him after the fact, but I was walking to the car and I was, it must've been hundred meters away and it was, it was half sold already yeah. to me. Um, I mean, if, if, when I say I put a deposit on the car, but I hadn't seen the car. Yes. So I could have got in this car and it could have been just a mess. You know, yep. you know photos can have a cover yep. stuff up. Or it didn't feel right. Didn't yep. feel right. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, might not like the drive. I've never driven one. Yeah. Um, so, um, so we meet and he's a really nice guy, you know, he's a doctor and he's semi-retired and, um, I get in the car as a passion. So the agreement was, it was about 50 minute drive to the PPI place, which was good. And I, he said, well, I'm going to drive to the place, Andy. And I said, that's great. I want to be a passenger for a while. And I said, if the PPI is going the right way and everything it looks like is going to happen, well, you can drive home. So I'm in the passenger seat. I thought these buckets feel really nice. <laughs> So I thought that might have been bad, you know, his body type and everything. Um, and then he starts the engine. And I thought, oh, I think I've, yeah, this is definitely sold. <laughs> it's just an <laughs> idle. Because I'd driven a mate's 964 air cooled a few weeks before. Yes. It sounds like an air cooled. Right. That so, that, so that was it, right? So you're on the way to PPI and you know, you know in your head the PPI is going yeah. to 
be the deciding factor. That's going that's yeah. to seal the deal for you. Tell yeah. the listeners exactly what it was, though. Tell the listeners exactly what this car is, the, the year, the, oh, okay. the color, yeah. and, and what yeah. it what it I'll is. What it right, is. okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so that's a 1999. Because it's rare, it's, right? It's very rare. Yeah, it's a GT3, obviously 1999, which is the first year they made them. It's speed yellow. It's a club sport. And it's got the Mante modifications. So only about, I think in the Gen 1, only about 15% were club sports. Maybe, I know only 30 came to England out of, I might have my numbers wrong, but there were only three speed yellow club sports came to England. Okay. Um, wow. That's in the speed many. yellow. Yeah, for some reason, speed yellow wasn't as popular as you think. Right. Yeah. In hindsight, it should be. But this is sorry, Andy. This is just club, club sport, sport GT3 996.1 club sports, not yeah. anti racing, just the basic GT3 club sport. Yeah, yeah. And okay. I think only about twenty percent of them probably have the anti kits on the Gen One. Maybe maybe thirty, but it's not not a lot. Um, so there's only can three. I, can I three ask one more question? Sorry, I, I'm interested. Yeah. How does the the anti racing kit that's put on aftermarket by anti racing in the UK? How does that work? Um, you can either get it, either Manti do it in Germany or JZM and RPM are the agents for them in the UK. So this car was done in 2011. Okay. At about 40,000 miles. Oh, okay. One of the owners, another reason this, owner, this car's great for me because I, I, I know all the owners back to 2003. Okay. This the first three owners were quite, happened quite quickly and they get cha- it changed hands, which is not uncommon. But one guy had it for 12 years. Um, wow. And he did the Manti racing. He did track the car, but actually when he got the Manti done, he didn't track it much after, only a few times. So it was a oh, weird right. thing, just the way it worked. But um, it raises the horsepower from about 360 to 400. Um, and uh, the noise is just another level on um, the noise. But but the club sport's important because um, in the Gen 1 GT3, there was never an RS model. Yes. The Gen 2 had an RS. And the Gen 1 GT3, I mean, basically Porsche management didn't want them to build it. Hmm. Um, it's an FIA homologation car, but if you read the history, the management of Porsche said, we'll build it, but don't ruin the brand. That yeah. was something was a comment was made apparently. So and what they to get it built, they had to um to do it cheap because you know they had the issues with finances in the 90s. What the engineers had to do was they basically had to go and grab stuff from the old motorsport cars right. because they already tool all the tooling and dies were there to make the castings so they honed in it, it and i don't know the full history yet but definitely gt1 the mons car engine is the base of some of this car the, the engine yes um it has the heads are related to a 959 they're not the 959 heads but there's right. a relationship design relationship there the gearbox is out of a 993 gt2 right so you can sort of feel why when he started the car up, it sounded the way it did. It's got this air-cooled thing going on. It's a unique sound. And so it's a really interesting car because it's, it probably shouldn't have even been built. You know, financially, yeah. they wanted to build Boxsters and base 996, and they were profitable for them. So for them to build this car, they couldn't go and retool you know, yeah. so, um, so that, and I, I always remember I that, that point one, but the point yeah. one, sorry, Andy, the point one yeah. is supposed to be, well, I know this is disputed now and there's like lots of debate, but the point one was always supposed to be the better one, right? The point one was the one, um, was the, the better GT3, the 996 GT3. I know that's um, disputed now. People say the point two is better. Uh, yeah. And I think that as a, if you want a track car out of the box, the Gen 2 is better. Yeah. Is it? There's little things like a Gen 2 has got an oil a gearbox oil cooler. Right. I'm sort of learning this as I go along with this. There's things they did to the Gen 2. It is the better car for track okay. out of the box. Yeah. But if I'm not – I will track this mildly, but it's not going to be a track car. Um, so as a road car, the Gen 2 has more compliant suspension. Um, the engine in the Gen 2 is slightly different. Um, the Vero Ram – in the Gen 2 has a, like a step to it. Right. See, so there's this character to the engine that the Gen 1 is a – the Gen 1's the, the stronger, I can't say the stronger, the, um, the more powerful engine, probably more tunable. Yes. They are a different Vario RAM set up in the Gen 2. So um, the Gen 2 is the faster car, 
is the um, I think it's I think it's a stiff body shell as well. Again, I'm learning this as I go along, but it's um. But when you get a Gen One and man tie it, um, and also put the bigger brakes on of a Gen Two, so the Gen Two had bigger calipers at the front. The Gen One was a bit under braked. Okay. But that's just a case of switching calipers, and you know that, that you can. The mine's got that already done to it. So that's one of the weaknesses taken away from the Gen One. Um, and with a man tie kit, it actually makes it. It sort of brings the power up to an RS, really. Right. Um, but not probably the character of an RS, but it's um, it's actually it's actually um, the Gen Two was I think thirty kilos heavier than the Gen One. Right. And the, so, the Gen Two RS is only twenty kilos lighter than the standard. So, but the RS is important because um, what they did with the RS was um, once they realised they had a hit with the Gen One, they brought it the Gen Two and then the Gen Two Club Sport. Yes. But the Gen Two Club Sport didn't have the single mass flywheel. They missed a few things out of the Gen 2 Club Sport because they held it back for the RS. Oh, right. So that Whereas was Whereas a Gen 1 the... Club Sport, yep. you have the single mass flywheel, the stronger clutch. Yes, okay. It has the – it's little things like they took out the, the airbags in the in the doors. So there's all these – there's little things they did in the Gen 1 Club Sport that were really um, held back in the Gen 2 because the marketing were wise to it. Right. I might be wrong. So, yeah. so with your car though, with the Manti Racing, with with your car, the G3 Manti Racing one, is it is it more yeah. stripped out inside? Are there other things that have been removed when they did no, the Manti no, Racing um, upgrade, or is it all engine, <coughs> suspension, sort of upgrades? Uh, so there's no, so it hasn't got the Manti suspension change. <clears throat> so Manti, there's various things you can do. Right. Um, so mine's just got the engine kit. Right. Um, and also, what they did was they put when they do it on mine, they put the little. Uh, the RS, Gen 2 RS, had this little extra lip at the rear for the induction air. Um, it's like a little um, feeder. It's hard to explain. Um, it sort of grabs the air at speed and feeds it in. Mine had that one fitted because it's quite expensive to buy now. So it's just a little bit of carbon, it's just a little element that it's a bit of a ram air effect that when you get up to a certain speed. Um, okay. It's very minor, but it's a nice thing to have. But, um, but mine hasn't got any suspension work, which I probably wouldn't want it. Um, okay. Yeah, they. I'm getting the car suspension refurbished at the moment, and it's gonna. I'm, it's gonna be stock suspension, which is Bill Stein's. I'm gonna run it like that because right. a lot of people say for road use, it's really really good actually. Yeah. yeah. So let me let me just give the listeners here the Instagram. Shall I share the um, Manti Racing one, the new Instagram? Yeah, yeah. Put that one in. There's a few. Yeah, put that one. Yeah. In. So it's that. Uh, have a look at um, Andy's Instagram. This is for the, the 996 GT3. So it's at 996 GT3 underscore Manti, which is M-A-N-T-H-E-Y. I'll put it in the description of the podcast, but that's that's what it is, at 996 GT3 underscore Manti. Um, there's no pictures of your Cayman R on there, though, is there? That's just all the GT3. Yeah, you'll probably see the Cayman R on the Porsche Drivers Island. I'm, I'm, Porsche Drivers Island, that's right. Yeah, so that's there'll be a few shots one. there, yeah. I try not to yeah, put too much on of my car. <laughs> Focus on other people's cars, but um, but now it's just interesting. So I had to drive that. Uh, uh, so officially, the thing was bought basically a week ago, and I had to go and drive it from Essex up to the specialist in Manchester. It was nearly 250 miles, and um, that was a great. That's probably the best day of my life. Um, I remember waking up, and uh, I've got relatives in Essex, so I've taken the car from the <laughs> cellar. I took it to Essex, my relatives, half an hour away that night on the Tuesday night, and I knew I was waking up to drive a GT3 halfway across England. It was a lovely sunny day, and I got into this car. I hadn't done a lot of miles. It's one of these cars, and this is what's happening with these cars. They, they ain't done about 1,000 miles a year for the last four or five years. Oh, wow. So it was a bit tight. You know, you got so to loosen these the, things up. What was the yeah. total mileage, Andy? 62. Wow, that's low. Um, six owners, which is actually low because one guy had it for 12 years. Um, oh, there's lots of them at 30,000 miles, which I just, yeah, yeah. We skipped over it, but did anything show up on the PPI that, that gave you a bit of concern that you thought, mm, maybe yeah, I've got to fix yeah. that? Um, well, I knew, I knew um, JZM had done servicing on it for the last few years, but it was, um, I knew the suspension needed to be renewed. That was, the seller said, well, that was my next job if I okay. kept it a year. So I knew the suspension was going to be renewed, but the, show, the things that surprised us, the, the, um, the steering rack was leaking. Okay. 
and that had been refurbished about six or seven thousand miles before. Yep. Um, I've heard since that that can happen; the leaks can come back. That's um, from no, that's from under use, though. That's what happened could, to my nine nine seven. That's what yeah. they told me. If it's not used, it dries up and it seals. Go, yeah, yeah, exactly, seals. exactly. Yeah, that's under exactly use. what's happened. Yep. It was done about five or six years ago, six thousand. 6,000 miles ago. So that, yep. that'd be right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's a bit of play in the rear where the drive shaft came out of the dip on one side that worried us. So, yeah, the specialist um, that's gone to up in Manchester, he sees a lot of these 996 and 997s. Um, so he might be taking the diff apart. We'll see how it goes. He's, he's, he hasn't started work on it yet. Um, I've got to be patient because he's they're flat out okay. at the moment. Yeah. So you, you went to pick up – you picked up the car, but you didn't – you. <clears throat> You did the deal. You knew there was a few things on the PPI. Did you? Yeah, could you, negotiate, could that, you yeah. negotiate the price a little bit because of those yeah. things? You yeah, did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not going to share the price. You told me, and, and you know, it's 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 you know, it's a big purchase. But mm. so then you 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 go to this guy in Manchester. So it's with Manchester. It's at that dealer now. It's at the specialist now. Yeah, yeah. It's um, Sports and Classics Limited, just uh, just outside Manchester. And yeah, what's really the scope? Good. What's the scope of the work apart from the suspension? What else is yeah, going? Yeah, well, they're going to. So that's going to be ripped all down. The the Bilstein's go back to Bilstein to be rebuilt. Um, okay. Um, a lot of new arms and bushings will be replaced. Um, steering rack, we might get it rebuilt again or a new one. They're very expensive now. Um, yeah, they are. And the rear diff. Once the once the well, he's going to get the drive shafts off and just feel how it feels with them off. He's going to play around, but this 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 company um, they can rebuild gearboxes. They're 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 proper engineers. Right. Fantastic. So, um, I mean, I bought this car with a big war chest. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to do miles, yeah. five thousand a year. I mean, I'm not going to. It's going to be it's going to be used until it um, until it's not viable, financially maybe. You know. So it's it's going to be used. Um, it's not going to be. Um, it's, an, okay, so it's not an investment. It's maybe somewhere to park money. Hopefully, it holds its money. But I don't think of things like that. I have other investments. But even yeah. if you drive it, though, right? Even if you drive it a lot, it's not mm. going to. I can't see it losing money. You know what I mean? Yeah, unless the whole economy goes and the whole thing. Unless folds, the economy but, goes, yeah, but then yeah, you hold yeah. on to it and sell it yeah. when the economy goes back up. Yeah, so, you there's know. no debt on the car. Yeah. I mean, it was just interesting driving. I knew it hadn't been used a lot, and I. For the first half of that trip, I just took it easy. I was just bringing the revs up, and you know, and I could feel the engine. Even the last hour of that trip was was, I had a good go in the Peak District, um, and you can just feel an engine. It's a great spot. Just to drive. starts to open up and lubricate. It takes a long time, a good few hours to yeah. get them really going, you know. So I really worked away, and by the end of it, it was just really singing. And it was that was the best hour of my <laughs> driving life was about last I week. I know the video on your Instagram of the intake noise, you know, in the cabin, yeah. you know, like and, and yeah, yeah. everything about it. The engine. <laughs> what about the engine bay though? The engine bay is, you know, like it looks Lovely. different to a normal GT3, and then you've got all that carbon on the underside, you know. Yeah, the, on the underside of the lid. Yeah. I tell you, one thing about the Cayman was, and I told my mates, I said, I, I want a car I could lift the hood and see the engine. Yeah, the Cayman. It's a really, really small thing. That's yeah. Maybe, maybe minor, but I just love to see the engine. I just want to see and keep an eye on things. And just and just with the car, because I had a leaking steering rack, I took some – I knew it was a bit low, and I took um, some steering rack, uh, some hydraulic fluid for the steering rack right. to top it up before I – did the big trip and even when i went to the engine and opened up the little uh, reservoir for the steering rack oil yep. just the way it was engineered and machined it was just had a different feel about it it's hard to explain um compared to the to the cayman if that makes sense um, yeah and the listeners really <clears throat> have to go to your instagram and have a look at the images you know what i mean the, Im- yeah, the images yeah. of the interior the images of the engine you know i don't know there's, there's something about that engine where that air filter with the 911 gt3 cup on it, the exposed that that filter just and and the carbon when you've got the the engine cover up in that image it's just like you know and little Manti Racing logos on the on the exhaust tips it's in speed yellow you know it's yeah. it's a fantastic yeah. I and mean, you must be so happy and oh yeah yeah so, like it's so one of these happy. ones it's it's not probably as mint as it looks it's it's a very good condition but it's not mint mint yeah it's got chips and stuff and that's cool because that's the way I'm you're going to drive uh, it. You know, and I, I um, it's about the mechanicals for me. I want to get that fully as good as I could. But this is the thing; they're really tough. I think basically they that engine was run very low tune from factory. Right. The bottom end in those engines can take seven, eight hundred horsepower. You know, it's just a over-engineered engine. 
they came out of the factory with 360 horsepower. I think they might have been polished. I don't know. I think they couldn't pitch it too far above the Carrera. Yep. Maybe they were worried about warranties. There was an untested engine. There's something going on where that engine isn't, even at 400 horsepower, it's still not stressed. Yeah. A man it feel, the, did it feel um, a lot bigger inside? Sorry, did it feel a lot bigger in the in the cabin to the U Cayman R? Did the no, seats? Because you sent no. me that picture this morning about the seats, how you prefer the seats in the GT3, right? Yeah, it actually feels the same size. Okay. It's really hard to – the 996 is so compact. And, um, yeah, that was – when I first sat in it, when he took me to the PPI, I remember thinking, this just feels nice. And what they do with the club sport is they take that centre console bit, the lower bit out – Yep. In the 996 between the gear stick and the... Yep. And I'd recommend anyone with 996s to go and sit in one with that taken out. Really changes the feel of that car. Yeah. And it's a gr- and it looks better, right? Yeah. I mean, I've seen some GT3s that used to come up in Australia where it was missing, you know what I mean, where they didn't have... They optioned it to not be included. And I know Marco, my friend in Sydney, he he's trying to get that part. He's been... He's had that part on order. Right, and they're really cheap at the start. I think a lot of people optioned them because there was a really cheap option or something. Yeah, he wants to do it that. on his turbo, but apparently the I think it's the part that you need is really hard to get at the moment from Porsche. I don't know why it's just this stupid parts thing. Something really? that he needs from Porsche to to do that console delete is not available. Oh, to do the delete. Yeah. Ah, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Because as soon as because the way in this one the carpet's all nicely. I don't know. It came from factory like that. It just looks like the way it should be. And this one's got yeah. a color coded center console oh, as nice. well. Yeah, no, I saw that. It looks really good. And it's a genuine um, cup. It's the Momo steering wheel, but it's a genuine cup racing wheel that you yep. can't even buy anymore. That was fitted. And those little things just changed the vibe of that car. So straight away I thought, because I thought the Cayman R interior was so nice that I was going to be stepping down, but yep. it's not like that at all. It's a different stripped out thing. It's got the full roll cage. Um, but on the 996 GT3, if you've got a club sport, you've got the full roll cage included in the price. Yep. But in the 997... GT3 Club Sport, they only gave you half the rear right. in the price. You had to pay extra for the front because what happened with the 996, a lot of people weren't getting the dealers to fit the front. And the marketing obviously realised, well, most people don't want the front. The yes. dealers were giving the front section to the owner. They'd go and store it, which yes. is what happened with mine. With the 997, with the 997, they obviously realised there was a bit of money to be made Yes, selling the front separate. So... Just little things change there. I think it's um, the 996, it sort of feels a bit more like the air-cooled era in terms of Porsche, the way they were thinking, mm, mm. You know, sort of over-engineering, because I don't think they made money on any of those GT3s they sold. No, which and that was reflected in the used prices for a long time on the 996 GT3s, right? They were in Australia. I can go back, you know, probably a long time now, probably eight years, ten years, and they were, yeah. very, they were really quite cheap to purchase um, as, you know, as all the listeners know, you know, when I talk about Australian prices, you know, I, I think there's a, I think James at Porsche Platz RSR Classics in Sydney, in Melbourne, he has a, he had a 996, I think for about 260 GT3 Club Sport, 260,000 Australian. But, you know, there's a, there's a 997 GT3 that's just come up Club Sport at Brighton Porsche in Melbourne for 300. Is that a Gen 1 or Gen 2? Gen 1, 997, 300,000. Club Sport? Yeah. Wow. Yep. So the prices are. That's so that's you know, I didn't pr- pay anywhere near that. <laughs> that's the price. That's the price of a nine nine seven um, nine nine seven GT three now is, and there's more online for more than that in on car sales. There's one for I think three twenty. The one in Brighton Porsche is actually quite a good one for three hundred two ninety nine. Um, what color it's only is got it? Foot white, forty thousand oh. kilometers nine nine seven. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing about the Gen One Club Sport is they made about three hundred fifty of them worldwide. And the interesting thing about the Gen 2 RS, they made 650. Wow. So the Gen 1 Club Sport is yeah. rarer if you want to, if you get in. I, I try not to think like that, but the other thing about the Gen 1 is that wasn't sold in America. Yes, exactly. The Americans never got it. I think there was something about crash testing or something. They weren't prepared to do it. Yeah. They had to, I think they had to trash two or three cars to do the crash tests. They weren't prepared to do it. So America never got them, but in two years' time, they can import on the 25-year rule. You know, oh, there's right, a lot of right. weird things yeah. about these Gen Ones, and and I quite like the yeah yeah. So what do you what yeah. else are you going to get? Is there anything else you're going to add? Because it's getting worked on now, right? You haven't yeah. really taken it on a super long drive yet, have you? No, you haven't not had not. the opportunity to take it on your. No, I got your, it. I got to go on the Peak District just before Manchester, and there's obviously cameras, but there was a few parts where I could have a bit of fun, and particularly in second gear, 
And straight away, I just thought, I love this thing. You just know. It's a different dynamic and you can yeah. lean on it out of a corner. It, would, it just handled things in a different way to the Cayman. The Cayman, the Cayman R can be unsettled by rougher roads. It will do this sort of okay. scuttling thing, yeah. Whereas I noticed on the GT3, because of the weight distribution, you could lean on it out of a corner, even on a rougher surface, and it would still grip. It's a, yeah. I just thought, wow. <laughs> I just thought this thing's... I've asked this question before, Andrew, though. Do you think you have to drive the GT3 or the rear engine, the 911, differently to the mid-engine Cayman? Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I haven't had enough time in it, but I, the Cayman R, well, yeah, any Cayman or even Boxster, um, they're incredibly neutral. I guess. Right, um, right. They just they're incredibly neutral. Yeah, they're, they're incredible cars. Um, and I, it's probably roads that I'll be able, would be able to drive faster in the Cayman R than the GT3 around here, okay. just in terms of my confidence levels. And just um, I'm pretty prepared for that. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be times that the GT3 won't be the faster car for me. Okay. Because some other people have said to me the braking points are different, you know, between a 911 and, and a mid-engine Cayman or... 718 or whatever it's like you can yeah. break later in the in the mid-engine yeah yeah de- definitely so i mean i i've definitely done things in the cayman r some bad driving in corners and i've got away <laughs> with it right i'm not i'm not i'm not a great driver i'm trying to improve all the time and the, and i probably cayman r was making it was flattering me a bit Andy, you are a great driver. You've got a you've got a nine nine six point one GD three well, Manti. Well, you are a great all, driver. Don't all say the gear, that. All the gear, all the gear, no idea. That's the saying, is it? But basically, um, yeah, it, was, it would let me get away with things. And um, whereas I can already tell the nine nine, the GT three, there was a few times the back did a few things of like I'm thinking that's in, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm right. thinking, oh, won't do that again, you know. So there's no traction control on those cars. Yeah. Yeah. Got so how long before you get the car? How long is it going to take before he's Oh, a month, yeah. I'm the, I, I sort of... So for summer. I, I pull it in a bit, yeah. He didn't really want it till the start of June, but because of logistics, I, I, I sort of said, can I bring it up now rather than flying back, you know, and bring it up. So he's taken it on. I mean, he, he, it's on their Instagram page a bit already. He loves it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. What's I mean, the name of the shop? Like, Do you want to give the shop a shout out as well or not? Yeah, yeah definitely. Sports... It's... Uh, sorry. It's Sport and, Sport and Classics Limited. Sport and Classics him, Limited. Yeah, Mike there, they're good mechanics, yeah. So okay. he, he, he sort of turned up, he sort of, yeah, it's a car. He knows it's fairly rare. They look after, there's three speed yellows. He looks after one of the other ones. There's one other speed yellow in Manti. Uh, so there's three speed yellow ones, club sports, two are Manti, and the, the other Manti owner um, is in Scotland. Um, and... Either I contacted him or he contacted me. We found each other pretty quickly once I went on Insta. Right. Yeah. I can't remember <laughs> how it happened, it. but they, they find you pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> they want to start connecting, yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's Andy, really we've good. gone we've gone way over time. I, know. I hope everyone's still listening. But let's it's been a great story. Let's just let's just go on to um because you're you're big on the drives, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh you're big on the drives. You just did the Scotland drive. But if someone's coming to yes. Ireland, someone's coming to Northern Ireland, they want yeah, to bring okay. their Porsche. Oh yeah. Where okay. would you recommend where would you recommend they, they take it out for a spin? Probably one obvious one, and that's if you go just north of uh, Belfast, so you go to La- a place called Larne, which is on the coast. If you imagine it's on the east coast, you basically start in Larne, and there's a coast road for basically two hours. It brings you right around to um, um, up to the Antrim coast. So you're coming on the east coast, and it loops around to the north coast. And if you get that on a quiet day, um it's a great drive it's a great drive um so yeah Larne to um dunluce castle would be the the, the 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 start and end point um and for some reason if you're prepared to start at the top end dunluce and come back towards belfast it's always quieter right most people Fantastic. start in belfast so the trick is to start up north and come back the other way but either way the traffic levels are nothing compared to england um yeah we've had that road to ourselves sometimes so yeah that's that's the obvious one there's a lot of little inland roads you can go to from there divert inland um but that would be the obvious one you, you basically start in Larn and drive north cool and you there's some bends and things there it's just it's, it's a lovely road um it isn't a patch on the scottish highlands though i was gonna say i've I was been there say the, Sc- <laughs> the oh scottish drive is what we always we oh. all want to do we all God. want to do that must have, that looked fantastic the image 10 of us went yeah end of april just after easter when it was a dead zone for traffic and 
we had this place to ourselves, yeah, 1,200 miles, and everyone was, was one came and one boxed an eight, nine elevens. They were air cooled. There were no GT cars. It was all pretty evenly matched, and we right. just went for it. Well, when I say went for it, when we had good visibility, you know, and, and, and obviously clear roads, um, and we still, you know, we'll never forget it. We got five dry days as well. Yeah, and, fantastic um, thing the to air do. Cooled, the three air cool guys were just they were, they were just hammering it. it, was, it was, so that was that was your last hurrah to the Cayman then to the Cayman R. Yeah, and I'm glad I did it. Yeah, yeah. And the guy that's buying it, um, he's a big car guy, and he's always wanted one, and, and it's really worked out well. Because you know, I'm not greedy on the price. You know, it's a fair price. Yeah. I wanted to stay here. He knows it's got sixty three thousand. I'll put ten thousand miles on it. In, in, wow. Well, yeah, that's cool. Cool. 18 months yeah so but he, he doesn't he's not a mileage guy he doesn't care he, he knows it's not a big thing it, it makes sense it makes sense for you to get rid of it i mean to pass it on because you have got the you know the, the gt3 and that's going to give you more than enough isn't it it's going to give you more mm. than enough fun i've only got one garage space and the garage as well that's always limits us doesn't it the garage yeah, especially always... if you don't want to leave your car out in the weather I was looking away. I was trying to find lockups and things around here. You'd think they'd be full of them. It's just not. I've, I've looked and looked and looked because I wanted really? to keep the Cayman R. Yeah, just it's just not there. Um, or they're quite expensive. So, but as soon as I had a few hours in the GT3, I just thought, well, I'm not gonna. I'd be better off running a Boxster with a GT3, right? With the comfort seats and stuff. It'd be yep. a different thing. Yeah, you know, that's what I sort of came to conclusion. As long as the G- Cayman R is going to someone I know. So I when can, will it leave your garage soon? Oh, about a month. Yeah, he's patient. Soon he's been waiting. He's, he's waiting. been Till waiting. You get for, your car back. He's been waiting a year and a half. <laughs> he actually bought. He told me he bought an MX-5 in February. All right. Um, he wasn't sure if the Cayman R was going to happen, and uh, he still got it, but he's, wow. it never picked it up. He must be excited though. Yeah, and I'm really happy for him because he's he, he's a he's a, he knows how to modify stuff. He really was hardcore 15 years ago. So I don't know where he's going to take it. <laughs> it. Might be a track rat. I don't know, but. Right. It's a car that I might want back one day. It's just a yeah. lot of history. So I wouldn't have just sold it on the open market to someone and disappear. So yeah, yeah. that's good. It was a hard decision. It was a hard decision. What that, does um Cayman R is special? Yeah. The other question I didn't ask you is I'm going to put it in the yeah. title K400. That's just what does that mean? Uh, so basically, it's um the 400 re- represents the horsepower. Okay. Yeah. So for some reason, if it was if the Mante mods were done in Mante Germany, yep, it would say M, it would be M400 designation. Okay. But when it's not done in the factory, it's K400. K400. So that's the full name, so, is it? Uh, yeah, Mante Club Sport, K400. Mantor K400. Okay. And I sh- I think that you'll see a photo of the number plates I'm getting printed. In Northern Ireland, has a different rego system. So this is the number plate was uh, K400. K yeah, it was K40 space OMR. But over here, you can change the spacing to K400 space MR for Manti Racing. That's and a great plate. Well, that's, peanuts, they cost nothing. That's well, a great well, plate. Hey, yeah. before we before we close up, what about the grill badge? Just tell everyone about the grill badge. Because that, oh, that was a Manti. really cool looking badge and it was a hard search for you, right? Yeah. Or, not, that was, or, or the previous owner wanted one or something, wasn't it? Yeah, the previous owner, he'd had a search on it for, like on eBay and everything for literally for years. And um, it's Manti Motors, an original badge for when they were Manti Motors. That's yeah, cool. And it's basically the shape of a Porsche badge, but it's got the Manti emblem and everything. And I remember looking a few weeks ago, just quickly looking, nothing came up. And I looked the other, literally the other day, Manti <laughs> bonnet badge, and there was one. It was used. It was yeah. off a 964. I don't know why I was on a 964. Right. Um, you, want, you, want it, you want it big money, so I had to be a bit patient. But I sent it to the, the guy I bought the GT3 off. He said, I just don't believe this. He said, I sell the car, and literally one turns up that week that I sell it. And I said, and I said, well, should I just buy it? And he said, he, was, he said, just buy it. He said, but I talked to the I negotiated the guy down a bit. So that's here so now. Rare. So rare. Yeah, yeah. And it's just love a bit of history about it. So that's, that's yeah. that, was, that was a nice find. So it's, I think a bit of, I believe a bit in fate sometimes, you know, the car found me um, yep. at the right time. I could have bought one two years ago, but it wouldn't have been a Manti. It would have yep. been, you know, so maybe the weight no, you've got worth you've it. got something yeah. really, really, really special, and I think all the all the guys that listen to this will realise you have. And I, 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 we really need more time to go further into it. But I, it, it's it's been a great, great, great story, Andy. Hey, before we go, because we're we're at the end, is there anything else you want to share with the uh, with the listeners? Uh, no, no, I just think it's great what you're doing. I, I only picked up in about six months ago, and I just went on my walks. I'm going listening, and and it's just interesting to, yeah, just to hear. Um, 
there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that's not relative to the common guy. Yeah. It makes sense. It's all this yeah. stuff. And it's, yeah. It's like you see reviews of people just hanging the back end of a car out around a track. We don't do that. You know, <laughs> it's don't. like, you know, it's about know how you know, to do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and even to do it, they have to modify the car. They have to, they, have to, they give them a modified car to, to let them do it. So, um, no, just, just great that the, 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 the stories and how people buy cars, I find it intriguing how you actually find a car and uh, the whole yeah, process of finding one. And not, yeah, I'm not one to go to a dealer and just pick it off the lot. That's sort of not the way I work. But um, no, no, it's great. And I think the whole Porsche thing, of, I thought it would be a snobby community, you know, and it's yeah, just it's not weird, like that. It? Yeah. There's maybe two sides to it. But, it's that childhood um, thing. Childhood yeah, thing coming yeah, back. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. And that's no, great what you're doing. And um, uh, yeah, no regrets. I think when I, you know, obviously when I did the deal on the car, there's a few weeks where you think before I actually did the full deal, am I doing yeah. the right thing? But then you get in the car and you drive it and it's like, well, I'm not getting any younger, you know? No, I really, I really like how you've been sharing this with me as well through DMs. You know what I mean? Because it's really interesting, like seeing you the pros, like when you went to see the car and then when you picked up the car, like that thing where you, I felt kind of sad for the previous owner when the previous owner is waving goodbye to his, you know, to his beloved, yes. his beloved Manti Racing, which, you know, the reasons he didn't really want to get rid of it, but he decided to, you know, and, and just that whole story about it. And it's just... It's his third GT3 996, but it's the first yeah. Manti. And basically, the cup filter that you see, the BMC cup filter you see, he bought, he found that secondhand. So that's a genuine race filter. Is it? The BMC cool. one doesn't have cup on it. He found that years ago, bought it. Yeah. Put it on his mantelpiece for the day he had a man to himself. <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. He told me this. So that's the stories we like to hear. Yeah. But he's basically probably going for a 991 GT3 because it, it's something him and his wife need to enjoy. They want to do European trips. Oh, right. It's a bit of a, yeah. So he's going to compromise for And he had a GT2 as well. He's done the 996 wow. thing. Which GT2? 996 GT2. 996 GT2. Wow. Yes. Wow. Twitchy. Yes. <laughs> 45 grand he paid. Wow. Back in the day. Okay. Yes. 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 Crazy. So it's an amazing story. So, yeah, but that was one of these things where um, I, I think you talk about buying the seller, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And this is definitely a case of buying. This guy, yeah. and again, I was put in touch with him by another person of Piston Heads. It's called Slippy Diff is his name. Anyone on Piston Heads will know who Slippy Diff is. And um, he, he was a great person to bounce things off and basically um, I think the seller of the GT3 said to him is this guy serious and he said he is serious you know um, so once I had the nod the chats could happen it's a bit like that yeah yeah you need and someone I, to yeah it's fantastic and I like what you said to me in one of your messages and I can't remember the exact words but you know you said you like to keep the Porsche stuff fun you know what I mean like it's oh, all about fun God. not being too serious and not worrying I think you said something about 90s but like what you said earlier about not worrying about the mileage which we yeah. kind of have all become hung up on a lot of us you know and it was never there you know when your dad was driving a car he wasn't worried about how many miles oh, yeah. he was going to put on the car and what it is you with know? the GT3s that everyone talks about these strong bulletproof engines and they don't drive them yep I'm just going, what, what, what's going on here? And, and the weakness of Porsche is when you don't drive it. I know from my car, yes. you know what I mean? Steel racks, seals, seals seal, yeah. anything rubber. Yeah. Um, so this car, at the start of my trip in Essex to the end of it, it was a different car. Yeah. It was I revving bet. out better, sounded different. Um, but I've already priced up an engine rebuild. If I get landed with that right. in four or five years, I mean, that's how far I've gone, right? And I'm, mm. things wear out and, um, you know, they, they, they cost, they cost. I might know it then, but... But um, it might end up in some American collection in five years, just sitting there rotting, you know, sitting there. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, not rotting, but I mean, sitting but there Andy, not being Andy, used. You, yeah. But Andy, even though you said that's that through the Peaks District, you know, you're taking it to the specialist, you know, that small drive, you've got a feel of it. Wait till you um, take it on one of your long drives uh, and it really settles in and the and tamps and, and everything is in order. Can you imagine how amazing it's going to be? You yeah, this even, is a car that's got tired suspension. I still love it. And yeah. just a few bends, I'll never forget get these first few bends that I hit the right way yeah. and it, just the way the traction works. But the, um, and also when I took it to the sports and classics, I said, Mike, Mike's the owner. I said, look, you take that home, drive it. I want you to, I want you to see what you think about it. Yeah. I'm not going to be, I don't even know what the mileage is when I've left it to you, mate. Yeah. You know, if there's another hundred miles on it, that's the way it is, you know, that's just a good just, way to do it. And then he knows you know, what he can work on it better by no, by doing that. Right. By actually driving it. Yeah. I said, um, it's, a, it's got to be used, you know. So they're, they're a tough drivetrain. That's yeah. what I learned. Yeah. I didn't fully understand two years ago. They're a really tough, tough drivetrain. 
if they're maintained. Fantastic, Andy. So that's about it. Must be two hours, is it? <laughs> We're at two hours. <laughs> oh, God, and I have sorry. to say to the <laughs> listeners, this, this is the longest owner stories since I've been doing owner stories, and this is number 76. So there you go. But it's a good one. Um, Andy, the thank Irish, you. The Irish has worn off the Blarney Stone, <laughs> I think. Must have kissed it. <laughs> it's when the Aussies get together. Andy, thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed the chat. Thank you so much for coming on Owner Stories today. And, and thanks for all those messages. And, and let's just keep talking. And um, I want to hear more about the car when you get it back and how it all feels and everything. Yeah, the, the, the Instagram page is going to be a bit dormant for a month until I get it back. And then it's going to get go a bit mental, I'd say, once I get yeah. it back. Well, you've got, July, a few followers. You, you've got a few followers on there already. You already you gained them. People are following that car. Yeah, yeah. I've sent oh, it yeah. to Steve. I sent it to Marco. So I hope you'll get a couple of followers there as I'm well. I'm interested to see what Steve thinks of it, actually. Yeah. So yeah. I, I obviously like listening to Steve's stuff on the 997. It's just, um, yeah, the 997, 996 thing, they are quite different cars. Yeah. 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 yeah they are different cars. A, a track car, 997 all day. Yeah. Definitely all day. But what Mike at Sports and Classics said, he's, he's had his for 11 years. I think I said at the start actually, but he's basically saying he's seen guys wanting to try the buy, buy their 996s back, right, for road that- use because what's happening the 996 and 997 as the prices go up, they're getting used less on track, so the fun on the road becomes more important. Yeah, yeah. And the 996 on the road is still really playful. Yeah, at, at legal speeds, you know. <laughs> Of course. Near, near legal speeds. <laughs> Always legal speeds. That's the main thing. Yeah, which is important Andy, for me. Yeah. We have to go. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Michael. All right. All right, everyone. Uh, that's Andy coming in from Northern Ireland with his current car, which is very, very special. He's 1999 996.1 GT3 Club Sport Manti K400. And his uh, current car, until he sells it in a few weeks, his uh, 2011 Cayman R. Um, that's about it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Porsche School Podcast. Bye for now.